high on a mountainside near the asylum in the ghost town of Jerome, Arizona. You are listening to Jerry and Kathy Wilkes. You don't know why. <laughs> Comments and views expressed on The Jerry Will Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect those of Jerry Wills, The Jerry Will Show, the affiliates or sponsors, or Channel U. sound back on there we go hello everyone i hope you're having a great evening tonight <laughs> we're a little late in starting got a weird thing going on with the uh, control board i have usually no sound from my own voice going into my own headphones a microsecond later so it's really hard to talk when you've got that going on <clears throat> i couldn't resolve it so I'll be stuttering a bit, I'm sure, as we go through the evening. But we do have a really fantastic show for you. Uh, our guest tonight is Robert Kreider from Kreider Exploration. And the, <laughs> we, we've been following Robert for quite some time. He's been following us as well. We finally met up in uh, Tucumcari, New Mexico, and spent you know nearly six hours just sitting there chatting, talking one thing after the other time blew past like it was nothing and we covered a lot of territory and we realized there's a lot more territory to cover i wish you could have been a fly on the wall to have heard and and been a part of that because it, it really was just an extraordinary first meeting uh this is a very honest very intelligent fellow and uh all i can say is I, i'm so impressed <clears throat> with the information and, and the effort he's put into what he's doing. Uh, there is a story here, a very complicated story, and it goes off in many different directions. It isn't just about ancient civilizations. It isn't just about UFOs, Bigfoot, paranormal. It's about all of it, and even more than that. So I'm going to bring Robert on, and... I think it's better if Robert just tells you the story about himself instead of me trying to give you some lead in with, um, you know, trying to tell you who he is and what he's all about. I, I think the best person to do that would be Robert himself. So we're going to bring Robert on and uh, welcome him to the show. Hello, Robert. Hey, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for being on the show tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jerry. It's my pleasure. I was just telling everyone about our first meeting and how amazing that was. It was a real treat for us. Yeah, I was a little mind blown. I couldn't believe the amount of time that, that did go by. I mean, that's one of those things when you're, you know, having fun time flies. Well, it certainly did. I'll tell you what, because I mean, I wouldn't have guessed we were there more than two hours, two and a half hours. And to walk away six hours later was pretty astounding. Hold on a second. What, Cap? When you talk, there's an echo. But only when you talk. <laughs> only when I talk. This sounds great. Oh, Lordy. Let's see what I can do about that. I can hear myself still. Yeah, and on, still. on my end, through the headphones, I've got no echo either. So. All right. Well, Kathy's over here monitoring the output. I don't understand why that's happening. That's a very strange thing. Well, it's just like my light, you know, works yeah. for years. Well, I, we use it see if, uh, constantly. That makes any difference. Can you still hear me? 
Yeah, I can still hear you, Jerry. Yeah. I think you said yes. Yes. And that has to do with one of these stupid things here. I don't know. We're just going to have to deal with it. Say it again. You're, you're echoing crazy. Uh, well, I don't know what it would be. No, it's none of these things. Test, 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 test. Sounds good, but it sounds like you're at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> I guess we'll have to let you do all the talking, she says. Oh, no. I talk too much as it is. How about now? Can you hear me? Sounds good on my end. All right. Oh, God, it's worse. Try that. Yeah, yeah. Echo Canyon. I thought, yeah, yeah, meant it was working. Hmm. You know, I, I've got clear sound across the board on on the backside over here. Okay. I don't know what well, what your what your watchers are getting. All right. No, not that either. So I don't know. Now you're gone. All right, I'm back. Test, test. Sound test, good? Test, test. Oh, that's good. You said, how about that class? But you, you, you could hear me? Say something again. Test, test. Sounds good here. Nothing. 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 Well, now I could hear me, but now nothing. Zero. So I, I don't hear you at all now, Jerry. I've lost you all together. Yeah, it's because I had that uh, switched off trying to isolate what's causing this. Oh, okay, I'm with you. Yeah, you sound good now, of course. Yeah. Just test. Test, test, test. Test, test. Test, test. No, I don't have a clue what tell it is. All right, how about that? Oh, I don't hear myself anymore. <clears throat> Can you hear me, Robert? Yeah. Sound good. <clears throat> The radio broadcaster is what was given a problem. I just disabled it uh, to figure out what's wrong with that at another time. So now we've got it. It's figured out. Thanks for your patience, folks. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's going to have to completely unnerve you. Yeah, All right, Robert, back to the program. Let me get rid of the uh, numerous windows I have open here and get back to you. So... What I'm interested in knowing, and I'm sure other people are too, how did you get started in this? Well, I, I've had a, a life of odd experiences and encounters that started when I was a really young child. And um, I mean, really, it was related to me that uh, on the way home, even from the hospital, there was red balls of light dancing around the mountain we lived on, you know, when we pulled up in the in the forest there. And then I guess my first experienced with a UFO, which I actually remember a little bit of it. Um, I remember being uh, seeing something weird in the sky 
and being rushed into the house. And I was uh, 11 months old at that time. My my mother related my later related to me. And then, um, you know, throughout my younger childhood, I actually had quite a bit of what you'd call, I guess, interference even um, with alien type entities and, and such. And, uh, you know, visiting the house or whatever. And I remember I, I even had, when I was like five years old, I even had my mom make a, a muslin uh, set of window dressings that even light wouldn't go through. I mean, when it, so during the daylight, I even when they were closed at night, I wanted to know that they were black. So even at night or in the daylight, we would close them and try to get light through them to make sure. Cause there was uh, always something I remember at my window on the second story of the house, which used to wig me out pretty bad. And my parents never took it too serious and I didn't really either. And then I didn't know it was that unusual being a small child. And as I uh, matured through life, I found out how unusual that was, you know, but I mean, I even remember seeing, a couple of discs and um, long cylindrical craft. Uh, by the time I was like six, seven years old, I'd already seen three or four. Um, once I had vanished for a few hours during an afternoon, and um, and when they finally found me, I was only about a block away, standing in a field, and I had been in the backyard, so what they say. I was real young then, so I don't remember too much, but I do remember when they found me looking up, and when they got there, I was staring up at a craft that you could say, call it was a disc, but it was actually... Uh, more stubbier, you know, it was taller than it, almost as tall as it was wide. And it had what looked like panels and it was rotating. And, um, and so it just kind of went on for there. And, and, you know, um, I, I saw some early shows like in search of and stuff with Leonard Nimoy back in the day, I think it's 75 or whatever on Bigfoot. And they covered some other pretty weird, uh, genre and aspects. And I, I, I knew there was a reality to it because of course, from a young age, I had already experienced quite a bit of strange things. And I thought that was the normal world. And then as they produce these shows that come across as here's the unusual, and then we grow up in school and they, they fail to teach any of this or relate any of it. And this is the things I wanted to see as I grew up taught to me. And so that, that basically built up a will and a want to go find these truths and lay them out for everyone to see, because obviously they weren't being shown to us. And that basically, that's kind of how it all started anyway. <clears throat> that's pretty wild what what years were these and where were you well i was born in 65 so by 70 um i was already experiencing you know and and cognitive of the strangeness and uh and by 75 of course you know i'm 10 years old by the time that in search of his role in the bigfoot stuff out and i'd already heard stories and things like that and then as it went up through the years you know um of course, I did the whole high school thing, and we were too busy going to the beach and getting in trouble to pay much attention. And when that all, when my oats wore off, so to speak, a little bit um, in the uh, mid to late 80s, um, then I really actually started on the ground, boots on the ground, going and taking a look for ourselves, you know. So, And that actually started a lot of that north of uh, Black Canyon City and around that area, north of Phoenix there. Oh, no kidding. So it's right around where we are right now. Yeah. Matter of fact, eight miles east of you is we, well, we actually went back in there because all the old miners, there's a whole generation now that's been lost. But when I first got in there, that place was still pretty wild. And uh, some of the old miners were still active and around there and just told us, don't ever go back in those canyons, you'll die. And, uh, and that was pretty much enough invitation for us. But another guy I trusted a whole lot he was a mining engineer and I worked superstitions and told me some real strange stuff they found. And, uh, he told me, he says, you go back there. He said, I, I know you guys will make it. He said, but what's at the back back there? You're, you're going to flip out. I'm not going to say a word, but you'll, you'll discover it. So, but, so I guess it was, they had known about it, but, um, that ended up being Coronado's winter home. Yeah. So, and it's tucked back in there enough to where you could even tell people about it. And there's a handful and a hundred who would ever even make it there, you know, so it's so rugged. Wow. And is that east of the 17 or west of the 17? East. Okay, yes. So you were, that's the Bradshaw Mountains. Yeah. it's Well, it's a piece of parts of it. It's actually like Sunset Mesa is the edge of that escarpment that's north of the town there. And that, that escarpment goes all the way up Agua Canyon and it's back in there. But the, um, you know, Arizona State University, we found a chalice to the that had the crest of coronado one of their family chalices and it originally was from the probably the 1520s they said and uh, but we actually took that to asu and they were a little bit rude about it 
Um, we wanted to establish some cooperation and reveal the location. And they just wanted the location and to keep the artifact, but not do an exchange of any information or open that door so we could be part of it. So we just kind of got it back and left. But um, yeah, there's a, there was about eight miles of constructed Roman style road, but it's, it was all taken out uh, with landslides and, and severe floods and stuff, you know, over the past. But um, so what happened was, though, everyone thinks they turned up the Verde Valley and then went on to Zuni. Um, into the White Mountains and then on to Zuni. And so everyone takes their all their full historical account of that. And really, they didn't do that. They went all the way to, to Black Canyon City. And the ruins there to the north, those ruins all had implements of gold. I mean, that's the edge of what they call the Golden Triangle, the richest surface gold area in the United States, um, even even Alaska. And, um, and so, but all the utensils and everything were made of gold in those seven ruins. And that's where they ate the, uh, the Black Moor Esteban. And when I say, when people go, oh, what do you mean eight? Well, they, the Apache there told me who were the rel relatives of those who lived in those dwellings that when they showed up, sure, everything they had was gold because it was easy to get, easy to work. And they could trade it with all the um, groups coming from down south and became quite rich. But anyway, when Esteban got up there, they saw him as a spy. And, and he basically was a jerk. I mean, his whole procession ahead of Coronado, he was not doing good things. But he only made it that far. So the Apache there said, nope, you're, you're a jerk. And they ate him. And uh, I said, why did you guys eat him? And he said, well, to gain his secrets, because we knew he was dishonest and we wanted to know what he was hiding. And But anyway, when Coronado got to there, they um, actually turned east and not up the Agua Fria Canyon because it's just too rough, but just south of it, less than a mile. They actually constructed a large road to access the higher plains up there, and then that goes all the way into Verde Valley. And on that access is where they ran across some ancient, predating mines that that were mined in prehistory who knows by who and because uh, they are tunnels and, uh, and then he set in his winter home there and just didn't tell anyone about the location so everyone turns toward the ver up toward the zuni early um, and then actually the first settlers of black canyon city said that there used to be three stone crosses directly to the east of town there um, uh, up on the hill and that they'd only been removed maybe in the 30s or 40s and if you read the original uh, writs, you know, about the Coronado trip, well, they erected three stone crosses where they turned east. So in that missing wedge there, because everyone turns east up the Verde Valley, they never go north. So in that entire area, there's where Coronado had all of his, all of his at main activity. And it's like supposedly been, you know, lost in time, uh, that whole era. So, Wow. <clears throat> now we're living here. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you're there. All the way around you is just really cool stuff. That used to be my stomping ground, so. Yeah, what Kathy's been saying for a long time, there's all kinds of stuff here. She just knows it. And, you know, you take a look at those mountains, they're just rough as hell. We've been up into them a little bit, but not, you know, to the extent that you have. And it, it, it's really, really rough, uh, rough terrain to navigate. Yeah, some of the roughest in the world, actually. And then um, I've seen temperature uh, at the uh, wrecking yard at the mouth of the Agua Fria Canyon at 137 degrees in the shade under their pole barn and um, even hotter in the sun. So when you get back in those canyons, are just black and they're like a big parabolic. They get that's why they, they you know, the old miners say they don't go back in there. If you go back in those canyons, you'll die. You know, they just cook you to jerky. But, um, but of course, you know, there's always ways of doing everything. So. Well, wow. pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you found some pretty interesting things back in there. And this is where your inception was for going, looking for ancient things, you know, I mean, yeah, what, ancient treasure, ancient knowledge. What was it you were looking for? Just anything in particular? Well, we didn't know what that stuff was back there. And then it took, um, a little bit of time, I started to find name dates that looked wrong, you know, just inconsistencies and things in the surrounding canyons. And I actually found what now we know is a cache site from their activity hidden in there. But I didn't know what it was at the time. But, yeah, basically breaking down and, and, and looking for co encoded information um, because we already knew where the site was. Now, what? how did they mark it and hide it and what did they mark that leads you to that? So kind of a reverse engineering method on that first one. And um, then it just, it grew from there. I mean, really, um, exponentially, once I moved to New Mexico, then things got real hot. And what, what took you to New Mexico? 
No, I already, I just had a plan. I had lived here as when I was younger in the, in the 84, 85. And actually my, my family was all from here. They homesteaded like 15,000 acres of ranch land and, and, um, and almost that much, uh, mountainous terrain and, you know, put in all the roads and basically around more in Northern New Mexico up there. And, uh, so I had family heritage here with a lot of in-depth story and history. And, um, and just, there was one little town that, I just knew, I knew in my 20s, that's where I'd end up. So uh, a little bitty hole in the wall named San Juan. So uh, we went to there in 91 and then by 94 began to find and and make leaps and bounds on discovery and understanding. So, and it was, of course, this area that I'm in now is basically a focal point of global activity that no one that was here doing anything had any interest in really telling anybody about it except their own groups or or, you know, organizations or whatever. Yeah, we've, we've spoken to, you know, a number of treasure hunters, not that we're looking for treasure, but we're looking for information, you know, knowledge, trying mm-hmm. to piece together the past. And it's really hard to get these folks to talk to you because they think that you're looking for gold and they might have found something. They don't want you to know about it. So a lot of... Um, solid walls that you run into when doing this sort of thing. I'm sure you must have run into this as well. Well, and even gaining the title as a treasure hunter. So they say you're a professional when you can make a living at something. And so there has been times in my life where I was considered a professional treasure hunter. Um, Most of the time because the sites that people were willing to put the focus, energy, and finances into contain treasure that contain most of this real wild history. It's never just one thing. It's like the ultimate of whatever they had that they stash would be records and the history and God knows whether items, you know, even ancient technology or whatever, and their value. So it all kind of runs together. The shame in it is, is when most of these things are being recovered by people who simply have a financial interest. So when all the historical, especially the off the wall stuff pops up, they're not going to mention it to anybody whatsoever. They'd rather see it destroyed so they can walk off with the value in currency or the currency value of whatever they've discovered. So we tried to approach it from the backside. Um, part of my whole quest was for information and not to be led astray by the value because we've been exposed to such high value. So I contributed most of the time my understanding and ability to decode ancient script and topographical layouts and monuments and things like that. Um, over a lot of years, I gained the ability to do that, which started back in the 80s, like we said. And even mm-hmm. by, by the mid-90s, I was, I was pretty prolific at it. And then, of course, really got intense because we did discover some high-end big sites. And, um, and I mean, you know, in, in the end, some, it's a curse if you find something too big um, when it comes to treasure stuff. We've done with all seven major three-door or three-letter agencies in the Gov, and we've been raided, actually, by all seven of them at one time with the National Guard. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that, besides the value, um, that they'd just rather keep a lid on. Um, that's for certain. But uh, it all kind of runs together. So some of, to get where we got, I mean, I had to do the work as a private consultant on different for great treasure groups that would basically pay me for doing the breakdown and pay me just right away for doing uh, deep earth imaging and stuff like that. So we have equipment. We can look in the ground 3D, 110 feet deep and do uh, materials analysis, tell between bone, wood, water, air, and um, it'd be on GPR basically. And, and so it, we, we utilize this stuff as well. So I was able to not just read and decode the sites, but I was able to validate and proof most of the sites with this imaging and other equipment and so but what it did is it got me to 100 or 200 sites over the years and i was able to form comparative analysis between all of these and see all the similarities so no matter who did it there was always common aspects and those formed keys and those keys allowed me to kind of crack codes um, and simplify it to where you see the basis for why everyone does what they do and then then we just became really incredibly successful after that and, uh, but I mean, it, it's, it is true, depending on what you find, it can be too big. It can scare government, it can scare financers, um, you know, it can, it can evoke greed and responses like that that are so beyond it that, that you know, uh, that, you know, just shuts everything down. And that happens quite a bit too, so. Yeah, I would think that if you ran into something that was potentially worth hundreds of millions of dollars, it, you see it in the movies all the time. And Kathy and I have encountered this in uh, the Andes, 
having discovered things that were potentially, you know, could make you quite wealthy, let's yeah. say. Yeah. I mean, to the point to where you're really wealthy, you know, we, we just walk away from it, but we're not there looking for that anyway. But I would imagine that in that situation here in the United States, you've got a lot of greed and avarice and I'm sure people uh, there's a risk of personal injury or death. If you happen to come across something and this one person doesn't want anyone else to know about it and they're going to take it for themselves. Have you ever run into that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was, had to tell a guy who's going to gut him like a fish if he didn't let me walk away one time over there by Wickenburg, Arizona for that reason. So he invited me out, told me he'd pay me to break a site. Once I broke the site, he thought he would just whack me and then have the secret of the site. So, yeah, it happens. Um, his name was Jerome. But as you can see, I'm sitting here talking to you. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that it turned out in your favor. Well, but I mean, those yeah. situations are really real and it, it, it gets worse. I mean, it even gets worse. So um, when... Often, worse, worse than death? Wait a minute, worse than death? Well, I mean, in a sense, yeah. You know, you can be under mountains of pressure. You can be kidnapped. You can be tortured. You can be, you know, and then killed slowly, forced to show them where it is and then be buried in the hole that stuff was put in. Um, oh, all, all those things occur, and I've had friends and cohorts and stuff that have experienced pretty well all that. I've had a lot of death threats, and I've had threats even from three-letter agencies, but I try to play with the game within a certain level in a realm. And that's that. So, I mean, but you really can't stop. It's like, you know, surfing or anything else. You don't stop surfing because, you know, what's under the water, you do the best you can to get around it. It's just what you do. It's what you do. So what is the interest in these alphabet agencies? I mean, it certainly isn't the value. It's got to be something else, I'm thinking. Am I right? Well, I mean, uh, one, we had the uh, Department of Economic Security was part of the entourage that raided us. So, you know, when... When you're talking value, so one of the last big ones that I was involved in that I was actually, we were the finder, we broke it down, we did the science, we did the excavation, we did everything, proof the site. And um, we didn't have problems until we had an independent third party groups come in and do scanning and as well take it to other laboratories uh, in the U.S. to have all the analytical work done on the results. And when it came back that they estimated site value at that time in twenty. I think 2010 by then, or 2008, I believe, by then it was valued at $40 billion. Um, that's really? enough to buy some countries. Yeah, there was an estimate uh, in excess of 300,000 um, tons, or th I'm sorry, 300 tons. So, uh, of gold? Yeah, of a smelted. And then there was also native gold, a tremendous amount that was there as well. And it's the second time it's only ever been seen in coal. Um, and we deciphered the site straight from, you know, the symbols that were on the surface and, and excavated and pulled, um, recovered probably the world's largest Spanish colonial tool collection, stuff that's only mentioned in uh, the 1541 book, D. Ray Metallica. We have them in our collection, and the only other view of those tools and those items are in the pages of that manual written for the king of spain so we came out of there quite prolific but the thing is though i mean our dig budget was a million and it was we expected it to go to 10 million by the time that we did rec that we recovered and after three hundred and twenty thousand or so it was spent on the initial phase which was mostly archaeology heavy excavation proving the site with technology and taking us to the point to where we'd have to then open a shaft filled with hydrogen sulfide under pressure which was phase two and because, I mean, there was enough just in the vertical shaft alone, not even the side tunnels and rooms to kill um, anyone within a mile of the area up to 30 foot tall. That's how big of a cloud just the vertical shaft would make that was fatal. So so you couldn't just pop the lid or whatever. And at that point, really, the investors, um, once it was proved, the investors themselves got together and tried to eliminate as many people as they could because they didn't want to share this massive amount of money. And they tried to reduce us so far down that it was laughable and um it kind of just tried to screw us out and hired other other excavation teams and of course they came in and quit digging because they had never seen anything like that and this guy ran his own heavy equipment company for 40 something years and he said he wouldn't even touch the ground till we were back on site so but since they had pulled what they pulled we actually shut that dig down and it still sits in situ to this day proven 
and we we pulled quite a bit of gold. We pulled it both native. We pulled, uh, but we weren't mining. We didn't have a mining mineral rights, so we didn't collect the native. But we did also find smelted gold and quite a bit of really neat things. Um, uh, steel alloys that were way too heavy and um, for being what they are. And then it comes back that they're actually, they have iridium in them, but they don't have the natural amount of iridium like a meteorite would have. And they also have strontium in them. So they've got rare earths added to the steel and then they're folded like a laminate, like a Japanese sword. And we recovered quite a bit of stuff like that. So it was like little area 51, you know, I mean, it was actually quite, mm. be, quite beyond and more advanced than they give them credit for in those days in the new world. Well, uh, I don't know if you're familiar or not, but uh, we interviewed uh, John and Myra Nichols down in Tucson. Uh, they wrote a book about the Roman crosses, but what they have spent the past at least a decade looking into is who was here prior to the Spanish being here. Yeah. And uh, the information that they presented with proof. I mean, it wasn't as though it was like they were just saying it. They had proof that uh, there was a hell of a, a complex civilization in the Tucson area, a lot of mining going on uh, for lead and silver and, I guess, gold as well. Yeah. But the uh, area around <clears throat> Tucson was about 3 million strong around 10,000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So what we've found is the population in North America before the Spanish occupation was right around 110 million. Um, and after their occupation, it had reduced about 90 percent. So yeah. people don't like to admit what true slavery is like. But, you know, they they liked kids better than adults in a lot of these made big, big installations because um, they couldn't get the adults would live three, you know, two weeks to four weeks. And the kids would live six to nine weeks and before they wore them out and killed them. So the kids would actually live longer working underground than the adults would. And um, hmm. so, I mean, that's just an expression of how they felt about them. I mean, your, your life is worth two to three weeks of work. And so that's, that's how they saw the people as this unlimited resource they could just tap and kill. And people well, don't realize Spaniards. that. But yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was, well, there was Spanish, Portuguese, French. They were... Yeah, all kind of involved in those. I mean, Spain didn't build and sail ships, really. If you really go check, it was all Portugal who did all that under contract. So it's right. not like everybody had big boats and helped. The Portuguese had them long before Spain ever walked up and said, let's go over there. You know, so actually the Portuguese have a long history of coming to North America along with, you know, many, many others. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Let me jump back for a second to this shaft you were talking about. Mm -hmm. You said if you opened it up, this gas would come out what kind of gas is it h2so4 so hydrogen sulfide um yeah so one How one you... one breath at 300 parts per million is fatal um and is that is that naturally occurring yeah it can be yeah but they take advantage of it so um they build traps and the traps can be many forms um water uh, acids and things like that arsenic in powder form, uh, so you can walk on and absorb it through your skin, breathe it. Um, you know, quite a bit of other stuff. They'll grind up the ones out of South America, and the Jesuit police learned they could grind up mummies from South America, and then they took that powder, and that powder was highly infectious um, and very fatal. Uh, and you know, some modern scientists have run into that, and even these days, can have you know have a hard time if they can cure it. So there's, you know, aside from traps, you know, made of boulders and leveraging massive parts of mountains and, and they did all the above. Wow. I, my mind is racing. I, I was talking to uh, a father and son team from Canada. Uh, they kept wanting us to go with them into Bolivia. They, you know, the, the death road in Bolivia. Yeah. Uh, along that, there is a canyon that shoots off towards the east. And they said, we go back this canyon, be prepared to be gone for about three weeks. And where they're going is this place that they discovered that's uh, where the top of a small mountain had been completely removed. And in its place, there was this huge building made of all of these big stones that was in the shape of a cross 
And over the years, dirt, weathering, and so forth, it's not as distinctive. But inside of this cross, which was hollow, uh, there was this fabulous treasure. And I'm thinking to myself, this sounds like a really interesting thing. They wanted to, us to come and film it, to do a documentary about it as they're going in to open it. We didn't know the whole story at the time, uh, which would mean we wouldn't go because it's dangerous as hell. Probably would not have come out of there alive. But they warned us that when you go inside, because they'd gotten to the point where they looked inside, there was this <clears throat> powdered, um, what was it, powdered arsenic, I think? Uh, some sort of powdered something. that uh, Mercury. That's what it was. As you go in there, it gets on to you. It absorbs into your skin. You're not going to really, I mean, so much of it that you're, you're not going to survive. Um, but they said that uh, the one thing that really got them excited, well, two things really, was that they saw that it was part of the treasure of the Knights Templar. And the other is that there was a uh, Madonna and child that was... Uh, life size the eyes of the madonna were just one diamond for each eye the eyes of the child were a pair of sapphires and the whole bust was made of gold mm -hmm. and it was solid and that was the beginning of what was in this place mm -hmm. and they wanted us to come along and and film going in and, and doing all of this we didn't, of course. Uh, we come to find out that it's in Bolivia, and <clears throat> the Bolivian guard uh, army guards this place. Uh, you don't get in. Yeah, that's about as much as I know about it, but I kind of know roughly where it's at. But they said it was part of the Knights Templar's treasure. Have you run into any Templar treasure in the southwest in your journeys yeah matter of fact um on a lot of these sites it they seem to have activity and even things buried um, that predate the european involvement and i and when i say the european involvement i mean the involvement that started around the 1150s and up through the 1260 and the first result that the first revolt that happened around 1360 that hardly anybody's even heard of um so pre-1100s uh, but yeah, there was there was a lot actually of stories that related to the same thing. Um, we see we see the the some of the real early Spaniard accounts, but of of finding uh, previous things like everything from ruins that were destroyed by catapult uh, and things like that, where the Native Americans related, like when they got into the area south of Santa Fe on the first expedition that rolled in there. It's re it's recorded. You can go over and do the research in that. It says, you know, they they got information from uh, a boy. They they tortured and killed one boy and made the other one tell him to, where they could stay that was safe. And he took him to a, a ruin that had been raised to the ground and said it was all off limits so no one would see him there. And when they rolled in there, they recognized that the place had been flattened by a European catapult attack and that the round rocks in excess of 100 to 200 pounds had, had been thrown with such a force that they went through two and three rock wall or built rock rooms before they'd go all the way into the courtyard of the ruin and uh so they they said that they felt that they knew who had done that and it had something to do with the early french and as well the uh the native boy said yeah they left tracks like you and pointed to their cart tracks so these were obviously europeans that were here uh, before spain's first expeditions rolled in who had already been having some interaction of course um we have found uh, Templar name dates that are 1311 and uh, 1308. So 1307, they were run off the African coast, uh, basically. And there was, you know, they had 60,000 of them directly and nine, 900, or I'm saying uh, 60,000 directly, 900,000 people in their overall employment globe, worldwide, um, as far as China and everywhere else. So uh, when they got chased off the African continent, you know, everyone says, oh, well, they went into France and they just became farmers. Well, 60,000 people just didn't walk into France and plus the almost other million that was under them. So uh, a lot of them apparently came to North America and they were here within a year into the uh, central part of North America already registering their name dates. And from what we can see, they also, 
you know, uh, Humboldt County in um, Northern California, they have what they call a Jesuit name code that had been lost for 70 years. They refound that in the early 90s. So a Jesuit had been up there to like 1160. And then, um, and we have a feeling that they were the same group with the Templars. So it's, it was the same, the same choreography basically to come to the new world. You needed the people that had the knowledge of astronomy and, and all the sciences and everything. And a lot of these early priests did. So everyone was kind of involved on the backside. And um, so what we see historically is we have three major ruins in New Mexico that are Abo, Quarai, and Gran Quivera. And um, none of those are Native American, and they all date from around the 1200s. So they were actually destroyed around the 1200s. And um, I think maybe as late as 1350 or something. And, and the natives up there told me that they did take everybody out and that nature even took part in it because um, it destroyed, like Abo uh, was destroyed by a blast of fire from above. And in the modern archaeology, when they went and excavated it, uh, it, all the there was people inside when it had happened, and they were all standing looking skyward when the ceiling came down, and uh, which is really off the wall. But um, in that in that place, we know a heritage because Bandelier Adolf Bandelier mentions on his trip into New Mexico looking for a lot of these weird sites for J P Morgan, and them. And uh, you can look, you can find this in in Adolf Bandelier's journals or the journals of Adolf Bandelier. And then he has his secret writings, which they call, majority of it is gibberish, which is mean it's code, um, letters to Morgan that are held in Santa Fe that they won't let anybody take a look at. But what Bandelier relates just right off the bat is he went to Abo looking for a large man-sized stone Maltese cross that was inside the main ruin at Abo. And that when he got there, he, they knew it was there in 1837. And when he got there in 1880, it was gone. And he assumed that the, the people they call the Texans, which further research reveals is a group called the Knights of the Golden Circle. Uh, they were actually the group fundamental in starting the Civil War. Um, and, and so they, they were the remnant group that was searching this stuff back out again after America came back in, which is why they built Fort Union and made the seat of the Confederacy in Santa Fe, New Mexico, of all places, and why the first shots of the Civil War were actually in Glorieta, New Mexico. They were over some of these early found things and, and whatever. So, Wow. I had no idea about that. <clears throat> Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, there were people who knew that these vast treasures existed in the Southwest, but they were usually, in my opinion, anyway, I, I think they were people that had wealth or power or both. And usually back then, wealth and power went hand in hand. But you have the churches and then you have the uh, monarchies and they're looking to really enrich their coffers one way or the other. You know, I've heard stories from the Navajo Nation uh, where there's, you know, dozens of bars of gold, huge bars, not little small bars, but like long ones that are buried up there on uh, the mesas mm -hmm. that they killed the Spaniards and they took the gold and they buried it because it was evil and they don't want any part of it. It's buried and it's going to stay there. And I'm sure there's a lot of that that went on because from what you're telling me, they were enslaving the Native Americans and using them as their workforce. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, this is a way you can maybe conceive what they did. And it'll also reveal to you that they probably could not have done this by themselves like the Spanish occupation. Um, so the first boats that went back when Santa, the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria were here, the first one that returned had smelted gold on board. Everybody that's a prospector and a miner knows that's impossible. There's no way in hell they came over here, found, and, and, and made good of an, a resource to the point they could smelt a shipload of bars and take it back. So what that indicates is they've discovered a cache that was already here. And when we know that right. Caesar brags, and this is funny because he has to get, give credit to the Celts here, where Caesar doesn't like to give, or Rome doesn't like to give credit to anybody but themselves, even though they were the lesser of most of the people they conquered. Um, but he, he brags about burning the Celtic fleet of ships in 55 BC. Okay, so, and it's, you can do the research on it. And he says the, the, the boats were so large 
See, normally these stay out to sea and then ships would go out to them and offload and trade with them. They don't even bring them in because you can't navigate them. And so these, but Rome was getting real nasty at that point in time and bulldog and everybody. And I mean, you're going to go back and find that we looked at where did the Minoans go and where did the Celts go? And where did the Bass go? And where did the guys from Fontainebleau in Southern France go that made all the big rock carvings? And everything? Where did all these people go? Well, there was mining operations going on in the New World. And Spain, and from since 800 BC, the Celts had been running their worldwide trade network and going all of them down the coast of the New World and picking up and dropping off people and goods. So when Rome, I mean, it's it's and it's logical. It doesn't take a lot to get to here. So uh, Rome built the burnt their fleet. Well, he said that his biggest boats that he could put one on end and still not reach the deck of the Celtic boats. And the only reason he gave them credit for their size was because he burned them out. So, which is what they did. They even talk about a catapult they had to develop with a high-speed winch and a metal hook to cut their rigging. So, this is a big deal. And the Celts had tried to pull in there and blockade the Roman Navy, basically. But what happened by doing that is they cut off a world shipping network. So, it burned the entire Celtic fleet, which stranded everybody in the New World in 55 B.C., um, that's why, like Barry Fell, a uh, Harvard professor, Barry Fell wrote America BC, and they find all the Ogam script, script and the Punic script and Nordic script, and they find all types of different from Carth, uh, from the Carthaginians and the Turkish. And it's funny because they'll be speaking their own tongue when they write, but they'll write it in a different language and a poor use of it, to where it looks like that maybe they even learned it on the boat on the way over here. Um, these things are all exist, and they don't fit in standard history, but they do when you just compile it together. So when everyone's looking at, oh, Egypt had big boats and Rome had big boats, man, people have had ships. I mean, big ships for a long time. Um, and they don't really ever mention that uh, in history. So they'll relate to us about the destruction of it, but not the implication of that destruction. So you don't have ocean-going boats that are 200 foot just up to the deck. These are 800 foot boats and more. And, and where are these going? What are these doing? And it represents an industrialized societies just to have the boat builders. Um, these were the Celts. They were not, a pagan was a name made up by Rome. These were some of the most advanced construction and metallurgists and boat makers in the world. Um, of course, not once they were erased from history. We're not related to that anymore. Um, but what we see in the New World is the evidence of all those things. Even the people from Libya, from the, uh, from the West Libyan desert, who they see the remnants of them. They even had carts thousands of years ago. And these people vanished. But yet we have the same script in the Zuni over here in New Mexico. And we have the same script on rock and everything else as those Libyans. But those Libyans don't exist in history or in recorded history over there in North Africa. We don't know. We just have their rock paintings and their dwellings. But yet, here we go. We have a better, actually a better record of them here in North America. The same thing goes for a lot of the Celt mon Celtic monuments from with Ogam. We have more Ogam in North America than they do in Europe. We have more monumentation and stone construction, but, but not the, the, the deep cultural heritage type like Stonehenge and things like that as much um, because they came over here as industrial families and colonists in, uh, in 800 BC, let's say the starting. So the place was never secret. You know, when people say, oh, they discovered the new world, who said it was ever lost? I mean, it was just lost according to the Euro doctrine that was being taught as, as religion at that point in time. And then we never changed that or we never altered it. So we're still actually just preaching religious doctrine, not evidential science. Um, the Book of Ballymote is one that is referred to in America, B.C., and that's a book that was found in Ireland in a monastery. Um, the book was, the first time it was known about was in the 1100s. So it contains a lot of different languages, and they're all set down like a cipher to where you can compare them and read them against each other. And it starts with Ogam, and it actually has Egyptian and a bunch of others. So, but what's unique about it is it has most of the North American script is also in that book. And it was discovered in the, in the 1100s in Ireland in a monastery. So you're looking at, they already knew all the script and comparative an analytical linguistics of that script and the world script in the 1100s. You can't do that without traveling all over the world, period. So, you know, it's sure. basically self-evident, I mean, by this point. Well, and I, I think there's been quite a cons concerted effort to keep history within a certain level of parameters. Uh, and why, I really don't know. Do you have any idea why that would be? Yeah, and it, it does stem down to the same word everyone knows, control. 
I mean, in the end, some, and then it's the same thing as anything else. It's like I tell people, they say, well, why would they lie? And it's not that they, or why would they continue to lie? And it's never that. It's like, why does a liar ever tell his second lie? And it's usually just to try to cover up the first. So when you've been doing that for eons since day one, and you're trying to put yourself so you, you feel important and you're a part of the history, which a lot of the British history and early British explorers and discoverers and who they claim are scientists, a lot of them did that. It was just as much ego as it was anything else. So they'd write in their personal perceptions and then that's become our science. Um, and it's never been revised. Um, you know, so where does that leave you as far as with the powers that be? You know, they've got so many years of this and justifying it and uh, tweaking the information, hiding the information, justifying the information. Um, you get so many years of that, that that now you can't let it go. It's like the kind of lie you can't live up to, you know. Well, and part of our early uh, investigations was taking a look at the giants. Uh, and there, there's been such an effort to keep the reality of the giants completely hidden to the point, you know, where threats and innuendos being made. If you happen to even find something like that, you're in big trouble. We, we went through that. Have you found any references to the giants at all? Yeah, absolutely. So you see them a lot in the ancient glyphs and depictions. And then um, we see more so with all this stuff, we actually see the physicality of it, um, which would not necessarily be giant skeletons, but the rem remnants of things that the giants did. Um, so like giant tools, for example, we have have quite a few giant sized tools and I could have had half a truckload of them. I mean, because we found an area that looked like it was for trade and giant tools were stacked in stacks of like make and manufacture. And they're identical to what Native American tools use, just three to five times larger in, in rock scale. It may not have been a person three or five times larger, but the, but as far as the pieces and the scale of the pieces, they certainly are. And it's neat because they'll be identical nap for nap. I mean, identical, but just so big that nobody can use them, you know. So... Um, so that kind of stuff. So we have found that. And we found areas, of course, where it, where it fits the type of cultural standard and cultural uh, application and construction or site manufacture that fits the giant tales from, you know, other locations. So We were following a story when we lived in Jerome of a giant the miners found in a cave up above the, um, I forgot the name of the river there, but it's just right you know really north and a little west of uh jerome sycamore creek i think it's called mm -hmm. but the the giant was found and with it it had like a cannon well, they called it a cannon it was a personal weapon this fellow would have carried um and you know, it, it was in the 1800s. We we tried as we could. If we finally wanted to get to where the cave was to at least investigate that, but it's owned by the mining company now, and you're not allowed to go on that property. They wouldn't give us permission. But we did find the newspaper article in a mining journal. Anyway, that uh, we thought that was really quite a find and we've we've heard other people say that they found remarkable things up sycamore canyon uh, as well did you ever go into sycamore canyon yeah i've um i've been in that area and quite a bit all over that whole place so from bumblebee all the way up to almost flag we've been on that side um i wheeled most every four-wheel drive access with uh, southwest four-wheel drive way way back in the day and um as well you know we've explored a ton of it so we've even done desoto mines and um, that's one I don't think anyone has ever properly explained who mined it. Um, I, you could fly. I've been in a room in there with no exaggeration. You could fly a Cessna aircraft in a circle inside one room uh, underneath the Bradshaw Mountains there. It's called DeSoto. And like um, they train out of Phoenix there. They take all the mine guys and for their final stages of mine rescue training, they take them into the upper levels of DeSoto. And when we described where we were going, they said that, you know, you call us, there's no way in hell you're ever getting any of us to go down there. And uh, you guys are there, period. And um, I mean, I've been 11 hours one direction uh, down in there and seen things that and, and scale of mining that I couldn't even 
almost couldn't comprehend. Um, and I've been in hundreds of ancient mines and, um, but like I said, stuff in there that you can't comprehend. Room so big you could literally fly a Cessna around in. And, and so deep that the ta tailings you're on on the side, you can shine high-powered lights down. And you, I mean, they just go off into blackness. And you could shine a light down that you know you can see a half mile. They still just return into blackness. Um, spaces that are just that massive. Um, a rocks. There's one place where there's a rock the size of maybe your average McDonald's. or No, four of your average McDonald's hanging out of the rock and they have it cribbed in with trees that are four feet thick. And this is in the Bradshaws. Where in the world did the Bradshaws ever have trees four feet thick? But they have it cribbed in with trees that massive holding a rock that massive. And then to get to the tunnels we went in, they actually had cables eye bolted in the bottom of this giant rock that's hanging out of the ceiling. And, and then you'd walk on these big six inch thick foot wide planks that were 20 feet long hanging from a cable on each side. And they would go one after another after another hanging across this expanse so deep that you couldn't get a return back when you shined a light down. You know, stuff like that. I mean, I've never even seen anything like that in anybody's videos in my life, you know. But um, who did all that? And coppers would, copper and gold would have been the primary out of there, mostly copper. But it's, I mean, it's enough volume to rival some of the big open pit copper mines. It's just underground. Those The, the Bradshaws are hollow. Basically, I mean, the, 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 the ceilings on them are anywhere from 100 to 300 to 1,000 feet thick. And then the rooms inside are basically just like hollowed mountains. And you never got to its deepest point ever. Not even. No, we went 11 hours down and not even. Yeah, and I got arsenic poisoning so bad in there that it took three years to get over it. And uh, we were going through tunnels that were blue with white fuzz. And then they had... Uh, gold veins in them a half inch to an inch wide uh, beautiful because everything else was oxidized out and growing so silver was glowing these black fuzzy clumps and um, but the gold veins were just clean because they don't oxidize and but all the rest right. of the walls were basically uh, you know uh, deposited sulfuric acid and that's what we went down there for actually because those crystals don't exist on the surface and the only place you can get them is down in like that but the acid was so thick that it looked like a fog in front of us and um, so it was all arsenic sulfuric acid and heavy metals and um, but nobody and, and go ahead. the ancient people the ancient people had used that that's why it was there well no the sulfides leach out into the tunnel but it shows the age of the tunnel so you can have a high sulfide tunnel and in a hundred years you'll get some growth and a little bit of color showing up on the walls um, but some of these tunnels were so old that they you couldn't see any exposed rock at all it was just all blue uh, cumulus or cloud, uh, like chalcedony, cloud-like formations of crystals with big white puffballs with up to like six-inch fur, and that's arsenic, and then big black puffballs, and that was the silver. And so, I mean, it was, I've never never even seen tunnels like that in, in pictures anywhere, you know. It, but it's because of the extreme age. They're just so old that they've grown that much mineral on the inside. So do you suppose this goes back before the Great Flood? I mean, how do you, how do you come to reckoning with this? No, I would I would take it probably, and because I'm a little bit biased with our other supplemental research over the years, but I would say anywhere from 9,000 years to about maybe 2,000 years ago. So I think that it, I think most of the activity went on during that duration, and I think that there was a couple of large spikes in that activity. I see. God, to, to mine something out like that, the tailings did they carry the tailings out or how, how did that work well that's the thing is you don't see as much tailing out there as well not near i mean the tailing piles would be absolutely massive it'd be as big as the mountain um you don't see that so how much copper was there versus what else was there i don't know but there's no when you go in there's definitely no way to justify uh, where the tailings went or where they got processed yeah we ran into something like that in cumbamayo in peru they I might have told you about this. Uh, they dug these phenomenal canals through the mountains mm -hmm. in uh, solid granite and basalt. I mean, the, the workmanship is just unbelievable. And yet, you, you might get so caught up looking at, at all this. It goes on for miles and miles. But uh, one of the things that occurred to me was... I don't see any of the debris from where they made this. 
there, there would have to be for what we saw there had to be some you know a lot of debris and and i mean it's like they took the side of a mountain and made it flat and then made the floor flat and then carved down a uh, a canal and it might be you know a few meters deep and it was always uh one to one and a half meters wide perfectly smooth but you didn't find any debris and that just always threw me is how on earth did they do this and what did they use to do it with right and yeah. it sounds like the same situation with this mine you're talking about yeah and we've seen evidence of like heavy rock lifting and things that even that you know no european would have ever had the technology or knowledge i mean stuff that that doesn't rival Baalbek. it's not finished block but we've seen manipulated stone in excess of 5400 tons so they definitely had right. understandings that were far and above you know what they had later even they, they lost that ability obviously can't help but wonder who these people might have been right and we found enough of them and you know like the uh, the information i sent to you today you know we can actually close that gap i think just with common logic and not a lot of inference um it's starting to reveal itself overall and we've been fortunate enough to find some of the things that i think are going to close that gap let's take another step backward farther into time and, and maybe into more of the paranormal when it comes to uh you know exceedingly ancient places <clears throat> have you found anything that's just really really old that's completely unexplainable yeah eight to ten thousand you know well maybe even older than that in north america not so much and the reason i say that now there is some stuff we found that probably is pre-flood that was re-monumented on the surface so basically what is there is underneath the flood sediment and debris and yes, we have stuff, even advanced technology that, you know, burn your equipment up in your hands and, and the whole nine yards. I mean, really, really hot stuff. And I believe that those are items and, and materials, objects, devices, whatever, that were our pre-flood technology. Um, but the surface of this continent, uh, you know, they call it Turtle Island for a reason. That's what the native, a lot of the Native Americans talk about it as. And when you talk about a lot of the emergence stories, you know, the ground's all covered in mud. And when we look at the the dates of what is here and, and and compare that to what's in South America and other places around the world, we do. We, it looks like somebody here just kind of took of a racer of sites pre-flood and just erased them off the map. And that's largely because this continent was subsided for the most part and raises and lowers. If you go by what... Native Americans, how they describe it, this conument, you know, uh, Turtle Island, it raises above the surface, it lasts that way for a while, it dips largely below the surface. So whatever was here on the surface here is probably buried in uh, tremendous amounts of sediment. Estimates have been 1,700 feet to, to 20,000 feet of sediment and hardened sedimentary rock sits on top of whatever was here uh, pre-12,000 years ago, let's say. Um, and and so what we, what we see is... is basically the remnant of that history. We don't see anything advanced. Uh, let's say stone cities, stone cuts, stone blocks, things like that up here because this place was washed completely clean, um, subsided and covered. And um, that's what we see the evidence of. So um, a lot of the sites, I would say, so we, we, I mean, we have, like I've shown you in pictures, we have sites that are a culmination of histories and locations from other global places and they start somewhere around 10,000 years ago and then they have the same aspect of uh, the cultures in other areas around the world 10,000 years ago um, so the 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 conclusion of that would be that they either moved around and spread that information all within the first couple of thousand years after the end of the major glacial period um, in a very short period of time they were global and our everyone was already doing it or that there was a commonality before the event. And so we believe that that commonality existed as a, as, as a global information system uh, before the event. And so what we see is like other places in the world, except with here, that nothing that was here remains 
from before that time. Like like when we look at Bulbeck or Pumapunku or anywhere else, what you can tell even with Pumapunku is that was blasted by a massive event. And those blocks, if you dug that valley up, there's probably those blocks scattered all over that valley in that dirt. Because when we look at how the in situ positions just from photographs, I've never been there. But it's easy to see that the blocks themselves are distributed equally in the dirt at different angles and things like that. And then they excavate them. And they're basically floating in the strata. They're not all laying on a base or anything like that, which means that they were tumbled instantly and set down instantly over a really vast area. So any big, big things that were hit here were hit so violently and with so much material and subsidence of land and thrusting that nothing made it and so even like Baalbek and stuff you have the big blocks there and obviously somebody repositioned them and put them back to use and of course as well they sit in odd positions and they even have dirt under them instead of being on a solid base they got dirt under them so it tells you something occurred that put that dirt there and um so I think North America was just basically scarfed just about clean, except for the places it was buried really, really deep. Well, one of the places that kind of supports that idea is Rockwall, Texas. Have, have you investigated that at all? No, but I'm, I'm really familiar with it. Yeah. And, and I'm familiar with all the popular debunking and, and the TV shows who have sought hard to debunk it and, uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, America Unearthed and some of the other ones. And I love the yeah. show, whatever, but they tend to go and debunk things that have a, you know, because if you take that by itself, oh, yeah, that's an anomaly. But if then you go down to the Biloxi River and you look at the human footprints of dinosaurs, then you go over to a couple other places in the hill country and they've got cart tracks, cart wheels, uh, places where there was fencing and animal tracks and people tracks and even where the rain drops. And all this happened right there at this beginning of the flood event. And then we're covered by sediment and then now we're eroding off. Um, mm -hmm. If you put it all together, it tells, it, it absolutely tells a very consistent story of events of people that were definitely here before some form of volcanically backed major hydraulic event, um, you know, buried them and, and wiped them out. And I think even after that, I think that there were survivors, um, so most of the flood myths have several survivors that are mentioned within them. And it doesn't matter if you go all the way back to Sumerian Babylonian stuff or whatever. There was always someone that wasn't supposed to make it and someone surprised they made it. Like in the Hopi, you know, the Bow Clan. They said, oh, wow, they were freaked out to see members of the Bow Clan because that's who caused the event that wrecked the place. And they thought for sure that Sutning or the Lord or whatever would wipe those guys out. But here they were again. Um, we see that everywhere. So... Um, I believe it's it's pretty easy to see that different locations sprang back at different rates after that event um, that because different surviving populaces. And it looks like you'd have, you know, a few of the very extremely intellectual people that survived without any other form of infrastructure or backup to basically do anything they did before, except maybe the items mm -hmm. that survived with them at the time. And then when as those aged out with no supporting infrastructure, they kind of went to the wayside. And I think North America is the same way with Viticocha and everybody. And people like to attribute like Viticocha and Quetzalcoatl as the same guy in these things. And it's a simplistic viewpoint uh, to kind of assume that the native populations don't know who they're talking about because they're not discussed as the same guy. Um, they mm -hmm. did they did different things and there was good guys and bad guys that came. And sometimes they even still remember the bad guys with a Stockholm syndrome. They still refer to them as, oh, they were great saviors when these guys were really the ones who who started them on their demise, um, so yeah. to speak. So, now You mentioned Pumapunku and uh, Tiwanaku. Kathy and I have been there many, many, many times. And one of the things I find really remarkable about it, uh, aside from, obviously, it's, it's quite a remarkable sight, uh, or series of sites really but the dirt that covers it is just silt so this yeah. fine dusty silt and we've had conversations with archaeologists uh, both from uh, europe the united states uh, well also from bolivia uh, asking questions trying to get uh, some idea of of what what's going on here the last trip we had down there was several years ago, but there is a high point above Tiwanaku, and you look out and there's like these little, little 
dirt covered points of a mountain perhaps and uh the archaeologist said you see that over there I said, yeah that is another part of Tiwanaku. He says, this whole valley, every one of those points sticking up is another part of Tiwanaku and everything from that point back to Tiwanaku. Well, this is a vast valley. And it apparently there's so much there that I, I would say probably 5% has been excavated compared to what's there. There's just an enormous right. amount and it's all silt when you take that in consideration with in the atacama desert you have uh whale carcasses and dolphin carcasses and fish carcasses at 13 to 14,000 feet and you know that the water came up that high and deposited these people there mm -hmm. how's that how's that cup of chaos going awesome i yep, got the show chaos folks yep, chaos right there Got that during our wonderful visit with Terry and Kathy. We exchanged mugs. We did. Yeah, I, I don't have any coffee going. I'd, I'd, you know, bring mine up and show everybody too. Um. So wow. Now into the paranormal. You know, you, you were telling me recently that October is your Bigfoot hunting <laughs> season. You have encountered bigfoot uh tell me about this yeah many many times now through the years with the research yeah um i'll type some encounters from you know great distance to just a few feet uh, from uh, friendly and playful inquisitive to aggressive and threatening all of the above and these are huge beings right yeah yeah so just Scaling using modern survey and scaling techniques, not just our judgment, you know. Um, so you're looking at uh, females of the group, anywhere from 10 to 10 and a half, uh, conservative. Um, and then uh, males, 11 to 12, conservative. And um, it, 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 a female that's 10 and a half to 11 um, that we've scaled, you know, you could fit two grown men into one leg, no problem if it was a suit. And so you would, wow. it would take six or eight people to fill up the mass to fit a suit. And, um, and the big male's even bigger. And the ones we've, I mean, we actually got to photograph a, a female from the knees up carrying a smaller individual. And then we got to, you know, go down and look at the feet print of hers and the smaller individual and scale those using survey techniques and get their size. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, like that family unit we studied pretty intensely for six years, it's been almost 10 years now. It has been 10 years now, um, but I haven't been on, on them, in there with them in a few years, but you know, hundreds of encounters over those six year period with that group and individuals of that group and tracking them and looking at their diet and what they do and how they do it and when they do it. And, and what have you found out? What, what, what's your conclusion on that? Well, I mean, if you start at the basics, I guess, and, and go up, it would be they're human. Um, because they're a bipedal primate and they are fully, fully, fully comfortable in bipedalism. Um, but as, of course, in quad mode, they can do things that even like a dog or whatever can't even do, uh, which is like, you know, go squat flat like a spider and go across the ground, you know, with the with their chest two inches off the ground faster than you and I can run. Uh, but no, we've discovered there, there there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of problems and there's a lot of assumption and there's a lot of conclusions without enough evidence uh in the understanding of the creature that's one thing we have found out not just what we found out about them but we we found out about the way they're perceived from academia the public as well as researchers and so we've discovered a lot of truths about them and that is they act like people and they act like people that really don't want to be messed with and that know that they're lucky to be out there and still hidden and that they act that way um we learned that they're highly intelligent. I mean, I would say as much as any of any standard human walking today, um, there's no reason that they would be any lesser. Basically, they're just a different type of human being. Um, uh, they're they're definitely you know of the of the Homo group, uh, and they act in it with cultural methodology as well as strategic methodology in doing what they do. So, and a lot of that's applied to 
course, hunting and living and taking advantage of your resources and this and that, but they're doing it at a level that is a human conceptual level, uh, which is why they're so successful. People love to, to put them basically in an ape bracket. And, um, and I mean, even if they're some type of relic human that's, that's not advanced, they're still not clin you know, uh, classically described as an ape because they're bipedal. Um, but I give them even more than that. I would give them equal intellectual skills to our own, just applied in a different way. Mm -hmm. Have they discovered fire? Do they use fire? No. And I think that's because they don't need to. So, um, if we, and, and it may be why we're not like them. I mean, I've often thought about this in a sense too, is, you know, I raised wolf hybrids for a while and, and I learned a lot about how these, the wild, uh, actual species, the genus and the species, what happens as you domesticate them. And it's like a fox just in four litters. If you take the foxes, wild, two wild foxes, breed them, raise them with the people. So they're constant interaction. In four generations, you'll get one with like black spots. And you can breed that one again and you'll start getting black and white ones. You'll get spotted ones. You'll get brindle ones. You'll get all these patterns and colors that we only see in domestic breeds. And it starts happening in just four generations with the fox. Wolves are very similar. Mm -hmm. So when we look at all the variations and breeds that we have in the world and how big the variety is, we get those all out of Lobos or Arius type canines, which would be the dog or the, ja or the wolf or the jackal. Well, there's only so many var variations of wolf or jackal, right? There's no wolf that runs around looking like, uh, like uh, a greyhound or, you know, so, but we can, but they're all in there. Those ge genetic variants are all in there. And I believe that I don't necessarily believe that we're a genetic variant that's been domesticated, but it's largely like that. So if you took a wild version of a human and you said, okay, what, what's a human require to be part of the natural world? See, we're really not part of the natural world because we have to have clothing and we have to do a lot of things in order to survive because if we just go out there, you die of exposure. So there's a lot of things we have to always build this up. But if we were built so that we could not die of exposure for one, um, like the gene that they're finding um, in the in the Andes Mountains, where the they have there's genetic traces from the Denisovan that or the Himalayas that have, have have genetic traces from Denisovan that allows those people to live at fifteen thousand feet, have high energy with low food, and these genes actually enable them to do that. So it's kind of the same thing. We adopt and then we build and then we reinforce genetic structures based on where we're at and what we're utilizing. So if we look at it in that nature, if you took a human being and said, okay, what could I push him to the ultimate so he was a part of the natural world and no longer needed assistance, that would be the epitome of what we see in the Bigfoot. It would be a larger oh. size because the earth isn't scaled for us. If you look at the size that rock breaks because of the physics, of the, ge the geologic physics and the structure of rock, the reason it cracks and breaks and the size it does because of its weight and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so... But it makes the earth have this constant, and we're too small to fit that constant. When we go running up a mountainside, um, trees, when trees fall and lay over, you notice they're not, you know, there's different heights, but they range just high enough to where they're too inconvenient for us generally, but they're not inconvenient for a Bigfoot. So you're looking at rock ledges usually go three to five feet with so many types of rock, it's ridiculous. And then you see us climbing up these sides of all these mountains and everywhere, and they're pretty consistent. And then once you've been on enough terrain, you realize this, that it's Mother Nature's size of the way she does things. But a Bigfoot, it's perfect size for them. So a large male Bigfoot walks up three-foot steps like we walk up our normal staircases. So we're stuck to this created society and structural society that fits our frame and things. We really don't fit the natural world and that they do. So I don't believe they've needed fire, structure, um, anything that we would assume they would require for the most part. They just don't, you know, they're just, they're comfortable at temp. They're able to procure food without an issue, without problem. Um, much more successful than humans have ever been because of their speed, their stealth, um, the hair they're covered in. I mean, it's not just insulation. It goes right down to, you know, the hair without a medulla. And, um, you know, we did a lot of the early work on, on mapping the translucency and even the color frequency of the hair itself and the way the hair acts and, um, and its ability to transmit light 
frequency. So like optic cable, basically, um, not not so much as like chromatophores on a on a on a an animal that can change its skin pattern or anything like that. I just mean that if you put that fur in an area and the area is green, the fur is going to have a green tint to it um, automatically. And so they're very 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 well adapted for not just as surviving but surviving with ease, hunting with ease, staying hidden with ease. What do you say to people that have the comment that they think that they can move through, I don't know, dimensions, uh, disappear, reappear, that sort of thing? Well, it kind of goes like this. We, we get that. Now, I hate to say white people and natives and whatever. It doesn't matter. But it's, it's a cultural example. So we get that largely as white people hearing stories from natives and the rendition that they tell us and what we get from them. So in all the years I've been around my native brothers and I've been involved with them and everything, um, there's, it's, there's a phrase, you know, they walk in two worlds. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a parallel universe they step into. When you astro travel or dream, a native will tell you the same thing. You're walking in the spirit world. So the, the, the world of dreams and the world of astro traveling and your intellect being projected from your body is the spirit world to them. So when they say, you know, they walk in two worlds where they're walking in this world and the other world, um, in order to do that doesn't require your body to disappear or walk through a doorway. You know, you kneel down against a tree and let your intellect go see what's going on on the other side of the mountain. When we talk about, oh, there are orbs seen with Bigfoots a lot. Well, I hate to say that, that that's probably accompanying Bigfoots energy that are going with the individuals that come to encounter you, but they're going in an energy form, which is far safer. And see, we even get that because there's been experimentations where people have concentrated about other people long distances away, and they've seen orbs and apparitions of the person or just the light orb uh, at the time when that person is projecting themselves to them. So it's highly likely that what we're seeing is the manifestation of our bio field in, in, you know, in uh, relative to its surroundings. I don't think that they need to go. And, and then I'm going to close that with saying, I've seen where they where they were walking with the group and they had to vomit and then vomit again. And everyone had to stop and then vomit again. I've seen where they've had horrible diarrhea where the same subject has had that diarrhea for three or four days. And you're talking about out in river bottoms when it's, you know, uh, five degrees at night, 22 degrees in the daytime, ice and snow everywhere and everything. And they're out there with diarrhea or vomiting. And I think, well, why in the world would would something that can walk into another reality stay out here when it's freezing cold, they're sick, they can't, you know, we've seen them eat sand and algae, presumably because I couldn't get anything else to eat Um, and things like that. We've seen them. What we've seen them do is do real things from an animal in the natural world that is governed by the same laws as you and I. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's demonstrated throughout everything we've ever found in research, which are really, really hundreds and hundreds of of uh, evidence encounters, uh, let alone encounters with them, but their evidence and what they do and how they travel and where they go. Um, in other words, they'll be in a place, they'll be in a, in a river basin with the family unit year round. They never leave. Um, and, and hit and miss in there. And there, you can see where they're surviving. Um, why would a creature that can walk into a portal, try to survive a blizzard and have to lay low for five days and then, you know, go out and, and hit a domestic animal or whatever, just out of necessity because you've been down for five days. It just right. doesn't. It just doesn't make sense to even have in the alien interaction where, oh yeah, well I saw Bigfoot in a beam of light. Hey man, people have seen people in beams of light. They've seen cattle in beams of light. They've seen deer in beams of light. I've even heard of where fish were dropped out of one and missed a pond. Mm. But I don't think that means they the fish had a deal with the aliens or necessarily the cow had a deal with the aliens or even the humans who are in the beam of light got a deal with them. Most of us all seem to be victims of the same thing. And, um, sure. I think that they do watch them a lot. I think that they mess with a lot. I know I don't know if they're real off worlders or subterranean worlders or on worlders, whatever, but there is this form of interaction. I just, I just don't see a lot of the woo needing to be factored in to explain what they're doing. Um, and re- another reason I say that is we even had responded to a native American report. We did this as part of the U- university of New Mexico study 
where one mm-hmm. vanished. And this is a, this guy's a hunter, and he's well versed in the mountains, and he chased it, and it vanished. But when we went and saw the episode scene and and did the analytical work, we were able to collect. Tr- a matter of fact, I got out of the truck and you know way early on top of the mountain, and I just went around the side of the mountain by myself or with one more guy and actually found tracks of the subject long before we ever got to where it encountered the man and we tracked it all the way down the mountain right to the episode location and so i already knew that this is the real deal and here's where he went well we just kept tracking him and he did pull a fast one on this guy he did a really good job and he must have done it quick but he didn't go anywhere and he didn't walk through a portal he went sideways about 15 feet from his his direction of travel and just made an absolute sideways leap behind a tree that was three to four foot thick and that's where he was at. So while this guy's looking at his prints and he's going, wow, I can't find, he just disappeared. He's only 15 or 20 feet from that guy on the other side of a tree. And the guy had no way of knowing that, but we can tell that because the tracks on the ground. And then even the Bigfoot even was a little messy getting in there. When he made that leap, he hit a stob and got flesh and hair and everything else. We got off of him because he was in a hurry. Um, So I just haven't seen, they're so good. The, why do we need to excuse their behavior as supernatural just because it leaves us in the dust? We're not that Good hard point. to fool. But if it fooled us, it must be magic. It must be supernatural. And um, I just haven't seen that. I mean, what I've seen most of anything is they are really held by the same limits and uh, and everything we are in the natural world or every other animal is, you know, from cold to hunger to sickness to loneliness to desperation to fear. I've seen all those things on them, and I just don't. You know, if, if you were visiting this planet, why in the hell would you stay once it got that bad, you know? Good point. Have you had any experiences with them where there was some sense of, of communication camaraderie acceptedness yeah you know the majority of the was, time so we're like hey robert we know you're there hi we're here to leave us alone yeah and i've i've uh, been able to track them by myself quite a bit and silently and move right into the group with them and then they i've got to get within 100 feet before they figure out i'm there and um and then i've got little playful interaction so teeth clicking and tossing little things through you, you know, or through the woods at you and, and whistling. And then they move positions and they whistle and then they click back and forth on each side of you and, you know, get you to look one way or another. And lots. I call those friendly interaction. And that's, I've had a lot mm-hmm. of that. And then as well, you know, I accidentally spooked awake a, a, a big alpha male at 57 feet. And um, he actually had been, was in there with a couple smaller subjects who I assume were little males with him. And, um, and they did not act the way they did when I was with the normal family. Once they were around dad, they actually became quite, you know, um, I wouldn't say aggressive, but boisterous and intimidating and where they normally wouldn't be that way. But when, you know, the alpha male was there, boy, I guess they had to bow up and act like big for daddy, you know. So, mm-hmm. so you get all types of the interactions, that's for sure. What was this in a cave or... No, this is just in a river bottom in a in a domicile location where the family group in uh, have, ha, uh, uh, inhabits year round, basically. So they're not transitory; they don't leave this valley system. They work this waterway, and the males there very seldom, really. I mean, overall, he's he's not there that often overall. Um, but when he comes in, like I said, there was a different dynamic to the interaction for sure. And and I've also I've had my I've had my glasses returned to me. Um, after a year on the mountain and they actually got brought all the way down off the mountain to where we lived. You could see our house from the mountain, which is why we went up there because one was coming to the house and I'm messing with the horses, banged on the house so hard it like to knock it off the foundation. Um, Mm. and he wasn't being mean. He was just trying to get our attention. And then, uh, but we tracked him all the way back up to where he was, got to see his eyes shine, got to see his prints and all that. And then i I dropped my glasses. I, I laid them down, actually. I knew exactly where I laid them down. They were on top of this mountain. I wasn't going to go back and get them. And a year later, they showed up at, down at uh, back at the house on a rock right there outside from the place there. And uh, they had obviously wow. sat outside for a long time. So I've, so I've had a lot of stuff like that. And then the only thing exchange would be uh, sap balls. So I've left a lot of gifts, 
not a lot, but I leave gifts. I'll leave food when I go in somewhere, do some research, and then I leave. I just give them a gift of food and I don't go back, you know, like a real gift. I'm not baiting you here. This is for having to put up with me for a little while. And, um, but I have been given uh, little rolled up sap balls and I've actually traded those and they'll take those and they'll give them to you too. So, um, what's, what kind of sap is it? Uh, pinon pine is what those smelled like. Um, but I've seen cedar and pinon, I, cedar and pinon pine. It's, what do they use? The What would be the purpose of this? What, I don't what know. is it used for? Maybe chewing, hygiene. Um, I see. Probably like the Native Americans, they used it for chewing and hygiene too. So, you know. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't either until we excavated a ruin one time that had um, had little yucca fiber knots. So it had yucca fiber and they tied them in the knots and then they had soaked these in pitch or sap. And then um, you could see where some had been chewed and spit out. And so it's kind of like like Listerine and a toothbrush all at the same time. So ah, how about that? But I've never seen anything like that with a Bigfoot with the yucca fiber. But we do find they, they roll up the balls and, and tote those around. And it's like the only things I've ever seen that they'll actually just tote around so that they'll carry four or five of them from one location to another. Wow, how about that? Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt like you were in deep trouble? It's like, oh, hell, I shouldn't have done this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, with the big male that I woke up, I stayed there for an hour and 45 minutes with them, less than 40 to 50 feet from them. And I got him on video a little bit. And uh, when he, at the end of that, I mean, he grunted. And there was a point during the exchange there where you absolutely knew beyond a shadow of a doubt you were, it was time to leave. And they were not, he was not going to put up with me any longer. Um it's still not the most aggressive encounter, you know. I've, I've been hit with a grunt that felt like I got hit with a rolled up piece of carpet. You know, if you took an eight foot carpet, a foot thick rolled tight, and you had a real big guy hit you in the ribs with it, it felt just like that. And uh, actually made me lose my lunch for two days. Uh, I didn't feel right. I couldn't operate correctly. Um, Would so, it hit you? Yeah, inf well, a sonic wave form from a grunt. So infrasound, really? basically, yeah. It felt just like I hit by, like I said, a rolled up carpet, just that thud. And it messed me up pretty good. Wow. And um, that's that was one during an encounter where, you know, an hour later we're on our belly and, and we're surrounded and got him a few feet in front of us, a few feet behind us. And then one that 60 feet off to our left comes out at us and throws a rock and hits us with a rock. And um, one of the smaller subjects, probably seven or eight foot. Wow. My mind is just racing. Yeah. yeah. That's that's it's a lot of information, uh, uh, you know. Gee whiz, I've talked to a lot of people about Bigfoot, and I have never heard this much detail from anyone. Yeah, and that's basically a drop in the bucket. I mean, it's it's real strange to live with all this in your head, and there's there's no real way to <laughs> relate the totality of it all. You know, it's most of it's quantifiable. It could be put into a study, and what's not could be. It was all 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 of our evidence and observations and everything have been pretty well gleaned with a scientific air in our mind or intention. So, uh, but it is, it's difficult to, to relay it all, you know, and I'm not trying to say, Oh, we're know it all. We know everything. It just is the way it is. Um, sure. <clears throat> the bucket's just to the point it's full is to the point it's full. You know, we've, we've seen them, how they get rodents and, you know, and all just so much now, you know, um, you know, how they defecate, you know, how, how they go in a group with one, one, you know, they'll have seven of them that will grow every day. They'll defecate together. Uh, don't know if once or twice a day. And then uh, they'll always have one subject 20 to 40 feet from them that is partially visible. And I guess that he's watching and he'll defecate over there. And they'll do that, you know, all day, every day. And it's uh, pretty wild to see that. It's kind of an intimate knowledge of them in a sense. And I guess maybe there's not a lot of other people that have had that opportunity to glean that. I've never heard of anything like that before, Robert. Let's switch gears now and go to another subject. That that was fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> my my God, I'm I'm just sitting here just running all this information through my mind, trying to make sure. Well, it's recorded, so yes, of course, right. I, I will not forget it. But um, okay, I'm trying to think of the name. Well, Santa Fe is the uh, pin on the map for me <clears throat> kathy probably remembers the name of the town north of there 
there was uh there are two people who just vanished without a trace mm-hmm. and we went investigating that uh, i think it was last year just you know wanted to go see you know what the place looks like what it feels like and so forth it was a little creepy and i guess you know the two aspects of this that i'm curious to hear what you have to say number one i'm sure you've heard about these things as well but have you ever felt as though you were near something that you shouldn't be near and that might happen to you because you're out there in in the wild in these places what's your take on this do you have any opinions on it any stories well yeah i do i mean so to give a point of perspective so from a man that i trusted a lot he was a early mentor of mine named jerry gray really amazing amazing guy um the type of man he didn't know how to tell a lie he wouldn't he couldn't tell you a lie he wouldn't embellish either and the things he had to say was hard enough to believe as they were and i was with him enough during experiences and then heard him relate those experiences to other people to realize that he was really, you know, uh, point for point on it. And uh, he described to me an event south of Paducci Flats, not far from where you are. Uh, matter mm-hmm. of fact, Paducci Flats, is, as a crow flies, probably only 15 or 18 miles from where you're sitting right now. And right. Uh, it's toward Bumblebee. It'd be actually before you get to Bumblebee. Um, and uh, just south of Bumblebee, I guess, as a crow flies. So maybe a few miles south. So, might be, yeah, it's probably 10 miles from you, at that, if that. So anyway, he was down there on that canyon in Paducci, and um, he was walking along in the afternoon. It was probably 100, 105 degrees. He was went to go walk over to some shade that he saw, and all of a sudden he started feeling dizzy and got blurry, and he said, it felt like I was walking through syrup. Everything felt thick and real hard and slow and hard to move. And he said he thought he was heat-stroked out, and he had, went to go sit down, and... Um, and he said he, he got so woozy that he, he, he couldn't stable himself to try to sit. So he walked forward a few more steps. And he said, and all of a sudden it started to clear. He's still on his feet. It started to clear. And his vision started to clear. His head started to clear. And he realized he was standing where he wasn't standing before. And he thought, what in the hell? You know, he didn't know what happened. And he turned around. He's a tracker. I mean, this is one of the guys I learned how to track. And I learned, you know, how to blast tunnels and all kinds of stuff from old Derry. And um, so he turned around immediately. First thing he did, look at his, for his tracks, and there were no tracks leading up to where he now was. And he looked around canyons and realized he was about a half mile, quarter mile, half mile, whatever, uh, down river from where he had gone into that foggy frame of mind. And he thought, man, there's no way that I could have got here, like passed out and just walked and don't remember. But he kept trying to tell himself that's how he did it. And, uh, and kept looking for his own tracks because he knew he had to leave tracks. And he said he finally came all the way back and got to where that episode began. And his, he found his tracks and his tracks just stopped. So from walking to not walking and then end up popping back into reality, you know, five, ten seconds later, a half mile away. So who's to know what's going on where? And um uh, in quantum physics and in, in time theory, basically, um, eddies and wells in time are completely possible, generated by by different things. Of course, being that strong, nobody would ever believe that you could generate a spontaneous wormhole. Um, but, you know, when we talk about uh, resonance and, and exponentiality, so when something resonates, it can go exponential pretty quick. And that can lead to an infinite amount of power and force in a small spot. Um Theoretically, it's possible, and I think that could be what's happening to some of these people. And yes, I have felt at times to where we were in places that were so, let's say, uh, hot, so to speak, that um, that you knew you had to watch your every single step, and and you didn't know what was going to happen in the next two minutes. Um, but that's both from the standpoint of the paranormal or supernatural as well as like a backdoor government same trip i mean we've had interference to where well we thought the meat was going to dissolve off our bones one day you know uh, as a result of an aircraft coming over and i don't know if it hit us with something or something on the site we were on emitted something or what happened but yeah i couldn't even breathe for 45 seconds um thought we were going to (laughs) die 
I, I was I was driving uh, our suburban. When we had a suburban uh, heading out uh, just north of uh, Mesa onto the Indian Res to buy some some smokes. There's a great smoke shop over there, and it was a good price. And you know, if you, you smoke, you're looking for the best price. Well, I drove all the way over there, and it was just a typical drive. I'd done it many times before, Robert. And here I am going along. All of a sudden, I blink, and I'm on this dirt road going 60 miles an hour. And I'm not much more than 150 feet from where the road ends, and it tees off left and right with a big, you know, mesa right in front of me. And I, I was like, what the hell? And so I hit the brakes. I s just screamed to a, a stop with all this dust and rocks flying. <clears throat> and I, I'm, I'm right there, at, right there at the top of the T. If I'd have gone another second, I'd have gone off the road and into this bunch of rocks. So I don't know what happened. So I call Kathy. And this is before iPhones and GPS and all that. And I, I, I said, I, I'm lost. I don't know where I'm at. And she's, of course, how, how is that even possible? You've done this so many times, you know where you're at. I said, no, I, I, here's what happened. I told her. <clears throat> so she got on Google Earth on the computer. She was home, took a look. And said, okay, well, you need to turn around and go back that road it just came down on. And then you're going to have to turn left and you have to turn right and you turn left again or no, right again. And then you get on the main highway. I was uh, maybe five miles or so from the main highway and another two or three miles from on that highway going east to um, the, the Bumblebee Highway. Uh, I think it's what's called. So, anyway, it, it was just east there, and it goes north from there into Payson and towards Fountain Hills. And so I went and got the smokes and came back. I've never been able to explain that. It, it just really, really threw me for a loop. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm driving a car. Right. So, you know, and that's, that's you're talking less, less than 30 miles as a crow flies from where Jerry had that episode. So wow, if, you, okay. if you're north of Bumblebee on the way to on the way up there, then yeah, yeah, okay. Well, something very strange. How about UFOs, extraterrestrials? You know, we hear people talk about uh, Dulce, New Mexico, underground base, blah blah blah. Yeah, I don't know if it's there or not. I'm curious about it. Maybe you know more than I do. I'm sure you do. Um, you know, you, you started out the show talking about your experiences with you know something very strange uh it sounds like ufo related where you are now and when we were visiting you had mentioned uh some of this but i'm wondering what are there really underground bases you know are, are there things out there that if you were to stumble into them you might not be able to get out or you might find something you shouldn't have um I certainly think that there's areas that if you were caught walking and it was convenient to make you disappear, they might just go ahead and do that. Whether it be off-world, on-world, some Turanian guys or whatever. There are certainly places you don't want to get caught walking around. Um, you know, and, and that goes as much for the Bigfoot thing as anything else. Like the trail in the Sandias where up to 30 people have vanished in a single year without one single investigation. Um, I've heard about that. So it can it can be convenient. And, and, you know, we largely have no why and where that went down, but it's, it's not, con er, I'd say it's a, it's not convenient for the powers that be to want to tell you about disappearances and things like that. If they reveal something that they're trying to hide. And, um, so I, sir, I think episodes like that have occurred and I, I, I know of locations to where the potential would exist, um, for something like that to happen, you know, um, like like when you mentioned Dulce, and I know during our private private chat, um, I had mentioned the another site like Dulce. So Dulce was known as Baca location number one, and there's actually a number two. 
um, and it's never been really popularly discussed or anything like that. And and I just I happen to be made privy of it through some, uh, let's say, uh, some information based on on the construction aspect of these sites, uh, more from mm-hmm. an engineering end of it, and uh, got made privy to this other location. And now, of course, we, it's not far from us. It's a there's a crow flies maybe forty miles from us and um and you know that's part of the basis for a lot of the strange uh that we are involved in and a lot of the ufos i've seen are here i mean it's around that area a tremendous amount actually and historically they go back as far as anybody can remember Um, of course these these areas are kept off the map i mean like completely off the map they don't want anything here and they've kept this place basically small and forgotten and hidden and out of the way. Even though we're on a major conduit throughout the country, nobody has a clue of what's here. You know, and some of the things you don't, like even I on, on uh, speaking like this, you know, you don't just want to run your mouth openly and go, oh yeah, this is here and that's here. And, you know, um, because certain groups feel as if that they're hiding, <laughs> so to speak. Even if, even if locally, you know, oh, we all know you're there. Um, you know, publicly, uh, it's a whole different question. And that goes right up to, you know, anything from three letter agencies to military, to church of Scientology, to, uh, others that have installations in the area that nobody's supposed to know about. So it's, you, you know, where these places are that you should not be going to is the bottom line. Yeah. A lot of them. And, and some are where we want to go. This is some of the stuff we intend on doing here in the very near future. And it's like the three letter agency thing. It's like, oh yeah, Hey, you can listen and, you know, chime in, whatever you're going to watch it anyway. Nobody cares. Um, and, and we know that we may encounter some interference, but we're also well aware we don't want to push the envelope to the point that we're not, can't be successful in sharing the truth, so to speak. So, um, Mm -hmm. but a lot of the sites that we want to return to, you know, they have inherent danger and some of them, you have all the above for whatever reason there is, there's obvious spiritual, uh, presence and danger. There's obvious physical presence and danger off world and as well, governmental agency. And a lot of these aren't like installations or anything like that. A lot of these are just, the pushing the limits of the envelope of what's real and what could be real and um you know the implications of these things um Mm -hmm. so uh you know you just got too many interested fingers in in either keeping it secret or or whatever their agenda and motivations are so yeah and you know obviously keeping it secret is an agenda but it doesn't really explain why there's an agenda like that you know, what comes to mind is a Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. I mean, the, that is a great unknown to me. I think that there's something going on there. Um, and maybe there are other places around like Skinwalker Ranch, you know, similar to where you are. Yeah, I mean, basically, where, when you look at Skinwalker, you know, <clears throat> they're the acreage that they are. And the entire, you, know, you need a basin up there is off the wall weird. And... um you know, and then when we look at like where we are here, you would say, uh, so not to be competitive, it's not like that, but to show that these sites aren't as rare as we might think that they are. And there's a few special locations in Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, um, like this area, the whole place is like that. Um, it's vast. It's basically, it would be the equivalent of, you know, a carnival versus Disneyland. So you have a carnival, it's a great expression of all the things that are there and all the activities and everything, but there's still a small example of the potential. And then where we're at right now just happens to be basically full potential. And so, you know, you may, you had mentioned, do I believe, you know, there's underground bases or whatever? Well, what is inferred by what we've experienced personally, the historical gatherings, the tales, folklore, Native American stuff, if you put that all together, you get that. Yes, um, not only is there what we would call alien beings or, or greys or reptoids or whatever that inhabit some Terranian realms, but they've seemed to dumb so uh, forever. I mean, they've seemed to have been there since before the, what we would call the deluge date um, far back into antiquity, even when dinosaurs were still roaming the planet. Of course, as in some of the information I had sent to you, the 
you know, uh, we actually have a lot of evidence that shows that, that uh, shows the, the, how would I say, it's not the combination of, but the correlation of um, information that indicates those creatures, their subterranean involvement, their interaction with the local peoples, and their interaction with the flora and fauna, which in the way of like nuke and the dinosaurs, you know, we've even got mm. examples of that, which fits all the Native American tales, you know, like the Hopi tales of the heroes having to destroy the monsters on the surface before they could come up because monsters were on the surface for generations there. So um, we we actually find this, you know, in glyphs. And those are the ties that really take it all the way around because we find the same things in Mexico and South America, and especially the Jalisco finds of the alien artifacts and things like that match exactly what we're finding in the Southwest. And and we had got to that in our previous uh, discussion together about how we are have now tied and closed the loop, so to speak, of those same beings. And so... Being subterranean, I think that has to do a lot with, I mean, there's, they, those things could be evolved dinosaurs for all I know, and they've been here for 80 million years, who knows, or they could be off-worlders. Um, either way, if you want to have a society that survives long periods on any planet, <clears throat> you're going to be subterranean at some point or another, because surfaces on dynamic worlds become dynamic, and when they do, we tend to get wiped away. And, you know, so and if you're going interplanetary throughout the stars, it's the same thing, because the only consistency you have are rocky worlds and getting them inside them, not atmospheric pressure, atmospheric composition, heat and temperature and all those other things that you have in all these rocky worlds. Well, as soon as you get a little ways inside of them, you're good to go. You can build pressurized environments. You can be insulated from all the outer effects, you know, radiation and all that. So I think that subterranean ism is just a nature of evolved and surviving species um and so and, and i think we see that because we see interaction in some very old glyphs and paintings which i'd sent you some information on that and mm -hmm. and that 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 interaction de often demonstrates a subterranean nature or you know something that's definitely of the of the world uh, but at the same time, they are often shown with crafts. And like I said, crafts interacting with the so-called monsters that were, you know, uh, occupying the surface at that time. Wow. <clears throat> and we have a number of pictures we haven't gotten to. Are you game to go a little longer? Yeah, well, I'll go as long as you want. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, okay. Well, then why don't we take a break? Well, we normally do that at the top of the hour, and now we're at two hours and 11 minutes. <laughs> so it, but it was just too damn good to stop um when we come back let's look through the pictures that you sent you can explain uh folks uh, you're gonna enjoy this i promise and uh once we get through the pictures i'll open up the phone lines if anyone wants to call the number and information uh will be on the screen and uh yeah we'll we'll go go through that i mean there's I'm looking at the pictures here on my uh, control monitor. There, there's some really interesting things here. I, I'm curious to take a look at and some things that are mind blowing. So folks, um, don't go away. We're gonna be back in just a few minutes um, with our guest, Robert Kreider. And um, well, then we'll pick it up in about, oh, about I don't know, 11 minutes, probably. So grab another cup of chaos, Robert. I will do. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to need it. And I think I will see what I can do about getting some stimulus going as well. Uh, tell Tara May hello for us, by the way. Tara May hello uh, for them, by the way. How's that? That's perfect. So we'll be back in just a few minutes, Robert. Um, we'll pick it up on the other end. I'm going to mute your mic and mine. Yep. Because this doesn't do it. But I'll do that. Well, you're muted now. So, okay, you guys, uh, you heard Jerry. We'll be back in uh, ten to a eleven minute break. Um,
Welcome. What? Still on a break? What well, seems like it's been a long, <laughs> long time. Does doesn't it seem like it's been a long time to you? Well, maybe Kathy's just getting Jerry a cup of chaos. You know, she makes really good coffee. Okay, well, I'll just sit back and wait.
everyone. I'm Gaia, the manager of the cafe at the end of the universe. I invite you to drop through the cafe at the end of the universe. Here you will meet lost souls, and mystics, explorers, and dreamers from throughout the cosmos and just about any time period since the beginning. While you're here, try our orange muffins and a delicious cup of chaos, the best coffee in the universe. We're located deep in here. Just follow your intuition.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the uh, next part of the show. Uh, <laughs> if you missed the first part of it, I feel really bad for you. I do. Because we just heard some of the most amazing information on a wide variety of topics, and it's not over yet. Our guest this evening is Robert Kreider from Kreider Exploration. Hi guys, um, and um, and Topaz. Let's get let's get let's get you back on the screen there, Robert. There we go. Yeah, I have to say hi to Topaz too here. She's, that's Topaz. Yeah, she's visiting us for the show. Oh, that's nice. Um, <clears throat> Kathy dug into the uh, into the cabinet. I'm not having any coffee. I'm having um, an energy drink, but uh, take a look at this. I Oops, there we go. I know you folks wish you had something as nice as this. I know you do. It says, Crater Exploration. Now, if that isn't groovy, I don't know what is. And uh, we, have, we have this up in the cupboard, and of course I do use it. Absolutely do. You might want one of those for yourself. Where can they get one, Robert? Uh, they can go to CriderExploration.com, and we have a store there. If you just scroll down on the uh, home page, it's actually you'll see a, a store bracket with a mugs feature there. You can go right to them. We've got a few to pick from, and we're going to be expanding as we move forward. Oh, that's really that's good. You have T-shirts, too. I remember you were going to sell some T-shirts or something. Yeah, and um, we just got a few new designs up. Most of those have been... Uh, basically designed more for the Bigfoot crowd. We've got a, a few other cryptid shirts and um, we'll be kicking them out for the ancient history and megalithic stuff too once we get a little farther down the road. So, mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, I, I didn't get a t-shirt when you were uh, offering them for sale. I don't know what happened. I meant to. But I definitely want one. So sit aside an extra large for me and a medium for Kathy. You've got two orders already. All right, I'll beam you a link so you can pick which one, so which style and design you'd like. All right, that sounds great. Yeah, that sounds that, good to me. Yeah, we're also building, um, or I've been building um, custom audio equipment for real high end, long range recording. Um, we're doing a sound sampling kind of on a on a higher level than I think what's ever been tried before. And it's funny because. They've been building recording devices and super ears and and whatnot, you know, since as early, really early times. And come here, kitty. Yeah, she gonna get her down. And anyway, so and with um, I tried with a new uh, a new way of doing it. So if we look at everything that's ever been built together, sound, and it's this is the way I approach and I look at everything. I guess even decoding things, it's all the same frame of mind. But if you look at the, you know animals' ears, don't look like anything that we're going to record sound with and because we use reflection and um, that doesn't work in a soft ear full of fur with a lot of a lot of design and, and so it based it on fluid dynamics and so now we actually have a products that we're putting out a product line that's also you know so we can find a way to help finance our studies and research and so the way I'm going to do that is to assist other researchers that can gain from whichever technologies we put together and then try to bump those up and then do it in a way that it's not, you know, 30 grand for a scientific sampling equipment or, or 3,500 for, you know, sports related, you know, audio equipment, or, you know, we try to do them in a range where we can get them in people's hands and, and get them out there because really it's science. If you really look at it, science isn't really a, a, an act of discovery as much as it is the study of what's been discovered. So it's very rare that, you know, scientists on expeditions and things actually find what they're looking for. Usually it's still with local reference or locals or whoever. And, um, sure. And so, you know, that's what we're trying to get equipment and gear in people's hands that will put them at that level, because those are the people who are out there who are actually gaining the information anyway. And then, so let's say you hear a, a scream or whatever and you want to do analytical work on it if it's not done at the right quality and with the right equipment well you're never going to be able to analyze it and use it as quantifiable science so you know on this edge it's just you know i just wanted to throw that in there because it's kind of a new direction we're going and and i'd like people to you know take a look actually 
I think you, uh, it was either on your website or on your Facebook page, maybe both. Uh, but I remember seeing that and I thought, you know, damn, that's a really brilliant idea. Yeah. And I, my background's in electronics engineering and designing things. And when I took a look at that, it's like, you know, that's perfect. Why didn't I think of that? Well, that's you know, idea. and there's always, and I guess it's with any design, because who wants to hear about the little aspects of engineering, you know? I guess a, su yeah. a successful product is something that people don't have to consider all of that in a sense. It just works and it works well. They don't care because it works so good, right? So um, I went for absolutely as simple as possible, but I, I, I tried to, I do this with race cars too. So I used to build a lot of racing stuff and, and if from the engine to your foot on the pedal, it's all about efficiency. So anything too much becomes inefficient in a right. sense right that's so like an audio gear as an engineer then so anything excess audio is basically interference that's where your distortion yep. comes from and all this so you're either gonna you're gonna build amplitude smoothly or you're gonna create distortion and that's what everyone else has been seeming to do um you know that's why our form of a dish is actually what most audio technicians would say well that's an incorrect form that's not right and so they have this preconceived formulation in their mind to how this dish needs to be to get sonic pressure to the microphone. Well, <clears throat> if you're around a corner, you can still hear audio, even if there's no surface to reflect it to you. And that's because it's working in a column of atmosphere. Without the atmosphere, you don't have any sound. And the atmosphere doesn't flow like light. It flows like a fluid. And that's why animal ears work, because sound acts as a fluid. And so you can compress it like you can compress a fluid. And people say, oh, no, you, com you can't compress a fluid. Well, if you go to the bottom of the ocean, that's what the pressure is. It's a compressed fluid. So right. it's, it's in, in air column, you certainly have tons of room for compression. And that sonic waveform compresses with the air column, right? Compressed air has more force than that. So what I've done is, is I used a flow into this and I use the laminar flow. So I use basically a torsional physics or angular momentum of the mm -hmm. sound of the sonic pressure. And by doing that, you know, I think we, we've gone, it's about a 4,000 to one um, amplification ratio for sur for active surface area to the microphone. And, um, and then we can set that down to a pinpoint location, uh, a degree or two wide at a thousand feet. So you're looking at 10 or 15 uh, feet um, out there width pattern uh, at a thousand feet that you can zero in on and not really hear much of anything else except what's coming out of that little circle and so by doing that man I mean when it when we finally jumped up and did it you know it's like dropping a drop of water or a BB into a drop of water and you see that when the drop comes back up it comes up with a little peak and then the drop right where it breaks loose well that's its maximum maximum force that it's got right when it breaks that's as high as it's going to go as much fluid is going to leave is right then and so that's where we designed adopted that design and that's where we put the microphone and so okay. you know instead of hearing um a human voice at like 300 feet which we do really easy um we can we've we've actually been able to test it and this is under optimal conditions you know 60 foot elevation up los all the way out but tested distances of a human voice at a mile. And so you're talking uh, a $3,000 27-inch Kohler dish is running 900 feet max, and we're looking at over 5,000 feet. And, um, you know, we've had a customer returns mapped, tested at a flute player, which isn't much louder than a person, um, and at two miles in the Oregon mountains in the dense forest. So, you know, that's, so it's just the same thing. It's like, and this is how we're approaching everything we do is like, we don't, I don't, in my, my research or I don't even pay attention really to other methodology. I go for what I, what I assume in a fantastical nature kind of way with a, like a kid's mind would work. I assume, wow, what would, how would they do that? You know? And then that's what we do. And so I'm finding and have found out throughout the years, whether it was our archeological technique and then you compare it to the states and we're like, oh, my gosh, they're like, like we, we don't even go there. You guys, we, we do not take data that detailed. We don't, you know, um, and so but I, I had no idea. And if I had listened to everyone else's concepts, well, I would have limited my own. And instead we went to the, the fanciful dreamway. So it's like watching 
NCIS on TV or one of these murder shows and you see their laboratories and it looks like a NASA clean room and all crazy. When in, when in reality, it's usually a rented mobile building out back of a station and, you know, and they're nothing like what, but that's our concept. So if you were going to go from that level and go, oh, I'm going to build one of these labs. Well, you'd build this space age thing. You'd spend tons of money. But if you were actually working on a budget in the police department, you know, you're going to do it anywhere it's going to work and it's going to work well. And so that's how we, that's how just how we go off. You know, that's how we do it all. Yeah. Well, I understand it real well. I built the world's first VR helmet in such a building, about 15 foot long and eight foot wide. And, um, yeah, I'm not going to go on about all that, but it, it was, you know, the idea, like you said, when you, you can see it in your mind, you understand, and you get this feeling you can do it, and you do it. It's it's a great sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. I've been there a few times, and uh, I understand how that feels. So well, my, and hat I, on, my hat on, my would be off to you. I had a visual. So as we get even into the research, and then people are going to – it doesn't close up until you kind of I, – I, I gave you what I believe would be a full circle in a sense, but it's still – it's like uh, two trees and just looking at two of their branches that touch each other. And it creates that full circle between branch to branch down to the ground to the root. And you're talking one root from each tree and one branch from each tree. That's what we're going to look at in a sense. So it is so diverse and goes to so many directions. But, but I believe it will complete a loop. And the, the way it was achieved was, in a sense, the way I've always cracked code. So if you show me a, a like a four-page code that's that's in... Uh, a, a rhyme or whatever um, or riddles or poetry and it's an actually incorporated code. So, or even a purposeful code um, like the guy that I, now his, his name eludes me, even though he's a local here, but the guy who, Oh, Forrest Fenn who buried the treasure and then left a riddle for everybody. Um, right. That was not that hard to really figure out, but the what the way it's done is you know you read the the last paragraph is the first thing you read and then you read the last three including that one and then all this clarity that's real strange all this clarity to the whole cipher will pop out and it's just the way men create code and so uh i do things tend to do them the same way and another way of looking at that would be in modern academics and science, uh, and I'm not I'm not putting down anything because there's a place for all of it, but the methodology which is necessary across the board, but you need exceptions to the necessary. The necessary across the board is to study what we're discovering. So in order to study, discover something you're even unaware of, um, you have to form a different type of perspective. And so the, the modern meth method is, let's say you want to know about a beach. Okay, so you can sit down on the beach and look down, and you can discover everything you want to know about the beach itself, correct? So you can analyze the grains of right. sand, you can look at how they rolled, and you can tell about wave action, you can tell about, hell, even what mountain it came from and then got deposited there. You tell tons about the beach. But the one thing you can never do looking down and analyzing every grain is identify that you're on a beach. So you don't know you're on a beach until you look at the beach. So we, we don't go every grain of sand and then say, oh, well, we must be on a beach. By looking at all this after all these years and these determining factors and everything, we try it a different way. So instead of looking at individual grains, we back off from a greater perspective which some refer to as flying at 30,000 feet and all that fancy stuff. But the way I see it is this, because it incorporates it all, is like being on a boat one mile offshore. And then look, for one, there may not even be a beach. So what you're sitting looking at the grains isn't indicative of a greater hole anyway. So what you see is the greater hole, and then you see a beach. And you realize, okay, that's a beach. The moment you touch it, you already know more about it than you would if you're looking at the grains for eons because I can look at the mountains behind the beach and I can say, oh, well, it's most likely partially made or made of the, the mountains behind the beach and the rock that the waves are crashing against. 
And so I can get so much more and it's accurate information. I can get so much more accurate information from looking at that, that wider perspective. And then you can, there's always time to go over there and then begin looking at the sand. But as you look at the first grain, you are already aware of, okay, I'm looking at this grain and this grain is on a beach. So that affects your mm -hmm. determinations as you study each grain. So you can get misled if you look at them grain for grain and then try to wonder where you are and all kinds of debate, right? Well, you could be on a dune in the Sahara. You could be all kinds of places. You could be on a slope of any hillside or whatever. And then people would argue about it forever where you were. But if you can just step back and, and look at the whole without trying to determine every grain first, then you'll you get a greater understanding. And so we've done that with the code systems. And, and by taking them... By acknowledging that everything has a root and whatever this root is that's been carried because there's all this similarities and all these symbols worldwide and I, we talked about this but it's worth mentioning uh, they all right. have some type of familiarity to them you know we look at them and we say oh well that's oh that's this incorporated into that would be the swastika or a triangle or like i said before the the heart the club the spade mm -hmm. so if if we, we you have to realize they all probably came from a root then and, and were taken by each people's usage and determine and, and and viewpoints and things and their artistic input over the years and years and years and they they develop into each of their own so what i did was i went backwards and i thought okay well instead of trying to break down what everybody's means and then go and then compare all the meanings which would be looking like at the grain of sand because you've got everybody's interpretation and their ego and all this other stuff that comes into these, how people do things. And I want to eliminate that. So you go the other direction and you say, okay, what's, what's the one or two symbols that all of them fit into or incorporate period. Let's not even mess with what they mean. And then let's go look at that and the, the oldest part of it and see what it meant. Because then all of them are probably going to have a relationship to that. And that's what, that's what I did. So that allowed me to break codes that allow me to go to almost any location in the world because the stuff goes back so far, the core of it, and and to decode it and find sites and find locations and then break those locations down. And then often going from that way, things are revealed to you. So you get big branches instead of working on all the individual leaves of humanity and who did what, you get these big branches of who did what. And so you can follow specific branches to faster results. And that's that's why you, we can now go onto sites and get a really good guess of who did the work. And it's it's amazing to the diversity of who is doing similar things that in a weird way would have been like what our military does or Area 51 or our science labs or whoever. They don't tell you about the crap they do. They just do the stuff they do. And they're not recording it in history books, and you're never going to read about it in a thousand years, 90% of it, because it's going to go into an archive. It's never going to go into a public. So it's, it's similar like that. So we say, well, it's not an historical account, and there's no writ of that happening. Well, look at Oak Island and the stuff they're finally digging out from under that. There should be a full-blown history. That's right in front of God and everybody over there, and there's nothing. And that just, it's just a tiny example of how much went on that we have nothing in recorded history about. And so you have to go then and say, okay, well, what's out there? So if I look from the standpoint of recorded history, so first, in order to find, you have to first stop looking. So that means you have to not have an idea of what you're going to find and limit your results to that because you might find something you can't conceive. So as we look around and we begin to see monumentation, rocks that don't fit, don't go there, someone had to have done this. Maybe, you know, and then you have to find really strange or wild you know, excuses for them, like glacial event on the Bradshaws when you have a stone monument. No, no glacier scrub the Bradshaws. Um, things like that, you know. Um, and so, but by doing this methodology, we're, we're able to then get a core meaning on all these monuments and stuff and bring them together in a full circle because you can then see, it's like, okay, wait, southern France at Fontainebleau has amazing sculptures of animals and some what we would call mythological with big lizards and reptiles look like dinosaurs and then a bunch that are familiar and they're cut beautifully with all the scales and there's people say oh they're natural well we find the same thing over here and then there's also there that known crosshatch patterns and things that are cut amongst them that are that they don't know what they mean they don't know who did it 
we have the identical crosshatch patterns and exactly the same asterisk patterns and line patterns that they have in southern France here. And I mean, there's no shortage of it. And it's all over the southwest and with the same type of large carved monuments and structures. So all this came from an original deal. And it's funny because when we go back far enough, when we pull it back far enough, it, it, ex, it explains the original template that I'm kind of describing is kind of just a, geo, a couple of geometric shapes put together. It's the base two, basically, a circle and a square. And those two shapes combined the right way um, map time. So they map the reality or the relative nature of the constant of, of reality that, that ebbs and flows, but, but it's always still constant. So, and they map that and they, that's what this form is. It's a geometric form that can be projected three-dimensionally based on a circle and a square and it makes a pyramid. And that's where all of this comes from is this, this, this sense of form. And it was so special that they wanted to remember it apparently in all things. So they incorporated even global mapping of sites and locations to this understanding of this template. And so using that template broke broke everything i mean and and the implication is is outstanding even in lost historical sites from the mines of montezuma um stuff like that which we've we've we're quite confident we well, are fully confident we've located using these systems and they're all there that's what revealed them and um but uh, even beyond that like cascurza um which was the mythical city from before the flood um, of the hopi legend uh, we discovered that in 2004 um, I didn't include any pictures of Cascurza, but I did actually include pictures of, um, of some of these other sites. And, and we went down down the road of, of historical connection between what existed at what time and who may have been involved. And then it's up to others to then look at this information and go off on the branches. And because this is going to plug into everything everywhere uh, globally. And it's... Um, it's very important for me to get the information out, but it's been important too to have this discussion so there can be some type of context, um, how it, why it's there and how it's there and why we should believe it is what it is, so to speak. So like I said in the earlier, you know, involved in treasure hunting, I know what's at the end of some of these trails. And it's things that most people would have a very hard time comprehending that actually exist because they're beyond even what we're shown in the fantasy movies. Um, uh, and, and I mean, there's so many side stories that go with it, but that's, that's, that's what's there. You know, it's, it's uh, off the rocker. And as it turns out, North America and the focal point in the center of North America is a location that was spoken about in the second pyramid text. And it's probably older than that, which is there. And I'm not saying it's older than the Great Pyramid or even those three, but it's older than that text. And um, that is here in North America. And these things are have been revealed to us. And like I said, slowly we've got to bust them out and get them to the public. But it's going to take a basis or a context. And that's what, you know, we've started tonight. And this is going to cover, you know, uh, not real broad, uh, but it is down three different avenues and they'll all culminate together and, into what is obviously beyond coincidence and uh, really does lock up a loop on what's going on so well i'm intrigued you know that <clears throat> well shall we go into the pictures let's do it it's a good segue good segue to these pictures um all right let me get the first one up here get this ready to go You should be able to see it on your monitor. So let's start with this one. Yeah, so um, on my monitor, it looks a little blurry. I don't know if that's how it's, that might just be coming across the stream, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this is just an, an example of an equilateral triangle cut out of magnetite. And it's not supposed to be ceremoniously placed because it's not supposed to show up. Basically, this is for the elect to be able to identify and I'm just showing you a dramatic example of what they'll do. So this magnetite is also high olivine. So it's extremely, extremely hard. 
and this has been cut and shaped. It's totally flat top to bottom. It's got beveled edges all the way around and it's exposed and it's been exposed for um, between 500 and 10,000 years and we don't know uh, which group would have placed it because uh, several groups repeated occupation like I said earlier everything back from what we know about 800 BC all the way up and then uh, through the Jesuit priests in Spain got involved in a lot of these sites and as well did the KGC uh, which is Knights of the Golden Circle in 1836 and up and then all the way to 1912 even and so uh, we're not sure which group uh, did it but we but it is, does fit the more ancient like the megalithic stone cutter type stuff and then uh, yeah you can you can go on all right here's the next one so this is at the same location and we're we'll, we'll try to flow through them pretty quick this is the same location and these are what you'd call reflection pools and this is a perfect circles and then a heart um, with a small dot above it and these pools be full of water and then they would use them as reflecting pools to view stars from certain specific points of view and then you could map those stars into physical locations on the ground and we go on well one thing about this is very interesting to me the inca did this as well they have reflecting pools in uh, basalt and they would sit there and study the night sky using these it's, it's fascinating they have these here as well yeah and then i want you to note on this picture before you go on that it's you know a heart and a circle and you also see another circle or divot um, at the lobes of the heart. And yeah. the way a heart is used is backwards than most people think. And, and they don't realize where that comes from. And so during my studies and my research, what I, de what I deciphered was where that symbol came from. It fits the template that I was talking about, the mathematical template, exactly. The heart is one of the shapes within it. But more importantly, the, it's, its aspect of being a heart, since it looks nothing like an animal heart, the reason is, is because it's a drawn back bow. So we would be at this point drawing the bow back and the bow is the curved portion at the top and the string is the, or the point is what we're pulling back. So right. our, our quest or our object objective is always from the point through the lobes. And often like in treasure hunting and historical, da, 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 they've tried to decode. They always think it's through the point. Um, and it's exactly opposite when it's used on topography like this or even on a map. So we can go on to the next picture. All right. Uh, here we go. So here's, this is only about 100 feet from the other one. And what you see is then a cut hole and a perfect stone heart. Same thing. And this is where it leads to. So there, So what I'm showing you by doing this is showing there's not, there's methodology to this. Um, none of this, none, nothing you're going to see was found happenstance or on an accident. It was all following information. And so the, the, the odds of finding the circle and the heart reflecting pool and then following that line it makes and then following finding the circle and heart cut uh, like this is those are pretty low. I mean, within 100 feet and then go ahead and go to the next. We've got a lot, right. so we'll have we'll have to cruise through. Them. Yeah, there are quite a few here. All right, go ahead. So this is at the same location. And first thing I know you'll see is that dramatic block sitting there that looks cut. And it is. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, in that even, if you look up the very top, just above its upper point, you'll see a wedge of stone pushed into the cliffs, kind of standing out there on its own. That's a verification. Just below that, between this geometric block and the back cliff, you'll see what looks like a heart laying on its side with the lobes to the left and its point to the right. That's exactly what that is. Now, the what looks like the geometric rectangular block when you pair it with the other block that's leaning down to the right it makes an open book and that's exactly what that is and then what the open leaf to the right sits upon that mouth-shaped rock kind of thing if you imagine is actually a well, well, I'll tell you what. I th well, no, I think we have to look on this photo. Is actually the head of a rabbit looking to the right. Now, these don't look like they're chiseled cut, but they are. Like, there's no natural block anywhere on this mesa that's angular like that one. That's a fully cut. And that's they don't want everyone to see this, only the elect. So they do that with that one block to be verification. And then the wedge above it basically double verifies it. 
Now, the rabbit below the open leaf to the right that I just mentioned, it has its ear down. It's looking to the right, if you can kind of make that out. And then you have a shadow cut in the block just behind and above that. It looks like a cave cut. It shows you this cave where you enter through the top and it goes into a big chamber. That is actually a scale. That. That's a scale model of what this is going to. So the rabbit itself is actually the forehead of a guy and or a, a head a head and on the right side and on the left side are both hands and i don't know why they're not coming up we might be a little zoomed in on this picture um or but anyway usually that shows but anyway that's what that is and what it, what it means is he's thinking and i bring this up because we'll see this in repetition later but he's thinking and he's got the rabbit on his mind and in the reference to what's above and then the heart line so now this is interesting because the heart is shooting to the left and there is a major stash to the left and there is also this cache to the right now it's very this cache to the right is more special and it's using the book almost like it's a religious trip so go ahead and go to the next picture all right that one yeah so this brings us to this photo and these do look like they are down a little bit and cropped, like the bottoms cropped off of them, Jerry. I'm not sure why. Right, let me take a look and see. Okay. That's, um, that's yeah, the system cropped it here. How about that? Okay. That's perfect. So um, what we would do is now that number four we see, if we look at the photo in the bottom half of this, we go up to number four, you're going to see there's the heart that was laying sideways and there's the open book below it now you can look down under the right hand leaf of the open book and more see the face with the hand and the finger and on both sides like it's in contemplation now it has the rabbit on its head and if you angle down down right from there and you see his number nine on the graph above is a stone rabbit now, this is all very important. You're going to see where we get, like, Lucky Rabbit's foot. Where in the hell does that come from? It wasn't lucky for the rabbit to get his foot cut off. So where do we get that? And all these old sayings, man. I mean, there's so many old sayings that are actually derived from this code. So the Lucky Rabbit's foot is exactly what it is. And you're supposed to pay attention to what it points at. And as we look at number 11, that's a stone mask. And that's extremely important to remember this stone mask. Now, there's a lot of other things there that we can break down if we want to add them in, but we don't necessarily need to. But if we look to the far left, and then on the upper graph there, we have number three. That is what we call a cantilever marker, to where nature can't make that. Because if you move the top rock, the bottom, if you move the top, the wedge just falls out. So only the compression by the top one is keeping it there, and it's kicked out. And it's telling you other information about where the entrance is. It points at the mushroom. And above that, you have a pheasant and an oriole and a fan. Now, you can see in the bottom of the hill that the layman would look at this, and it just looks like a hill. But the elect see what I'm seeing. Okay, so, and, and as a proven to this site, I'll, we'll, we'll go through this, and I'll actually show you how it works. So go ahead and go to the next one. Just remember what's here. So here's the, here's the rabbit and the stone mask in front of the foot to the very extreme right. And look how it looks kind of like a Polynesian mask or whatever. Really take a, just remember that real, real well, that mask. And go ahead and go forward. All right. There we are. Now, if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, do you see it? Is it a face? Yeah, that's the mask. And it's actually oh. identical line for line. Is that the same one that was in this uh, previous one lying here? Well, on it's on the right side. It's a it's a half mile away. So oh, really, when you follow the lines, you go to it, and it's a half mile away. And there's the mask actually cut into the stone. This is where they're telling you to go. Now, as verification, and and to show how excited and exorbitant you should be, um, see the rock that the kind of uh, in the center, just above center of the photo there. There's a rock standing on top, kind of a darker color. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, yeah. now go on, go on to the next picture. All right. There. There's that rock. 
And what that is, is a cut erect phallic symbol. And it's placed there to show the excitement or exuberance. So you're at your destination. Oh. Now, go ahead and go again. And the actual entrance to this place that we saw before is just right in front of this. And then behind it, looking back, is the next photo, I believe. All right. Okay, so this is a turtle's head. Right. And under the head, beneath the neck, you'll see kind of a square cut. And that has a cross that. that has a cross hatch cut into it. So that's not natural at all. It's actually, you know, on a good picture you can see the this is these are old cameras. These are old pictures, but but because this is actually in film. This is before digital cameras, and this this uh, that's a cut cross hatch symbol just like you'd find in southern France. Okay, so this te this is looking back toward the the erect phallic symbol, and so and we know the entrance is actually directly below this. And it's covered Close by a head. yeah, and it's covered by a massive stone that when we tunneled underneath that we pulled up smelted rolled lead, uh, that was real cool and some other stuff. But that's where this entrance is. And then go ahead and go on. We'll get through these. All right. Okay. So at the other end where the heart is actually pointing is this place. And um, I didn't go into all the photos because they were in some other archives and it was getting tough to get them all out. So. But in this location are some really deep cracks, and, and there's a rock here that weighs about 5,400 tons. I think it's 40 by 60 by 90. And it, um, when we got that door stone you see the, there that's open is a cut stone, and that's a door plate. And the, the skull and things were not found right there. But this door plate has been pulled back, in, or slid back in ancient time, but it did cover a hole to the left. And we could see down in there. And so we went around and we got underneath there. And underneath is where we pulled out the skull and the scapula you're seeing. And it's interesting because the 5,400 ton rock that we believed was moved was actually crushing this animal. So this is an antelope and we're deep in the ground and there's no reason an antelope would ever be where we found it. And it's actually an old technique where they backfill these big fissures with caliche and clay chunks pack them and then they mine underneath them and they make these stable tunnels that you don't know are down there and it was in one of those under the rock so you know all of his body except for the scapula and the skull was smashed under that 5400 ton rock and you can go on to the next one and so this is just a close-up good shot after he was brought out and uh, fixed and we named him edgar and it turns out he's a 13,000 year old antelope 13,000 years of this, would that signify this is a 13,000 year old site? Uh, yeah. Or they, you know, they said they, they may have lived as late as 11,000 years or so, but most of them died out 13,000 years ago. So, and then we can, this, so it's basically an ice age antelope. So uh, it does. Yeah. Wow. It, it states that that rock was put on top of that creature um, yeah, thir you know, eleven to 13,000. So let's go on. There you go. Okay, so this is what's interesting. Here's a stone head that's, that's um, incorporated into one of our sites that's kind of like a directory at a mall. So it's like you are here, and then it directs you to everything all the way around in the valley. And in particular, one major thing is that it directs you to and has a lot of coded information and these heads, um, it may just look, oh, well, that could be an outcrop, but actually it's a head. It's cut all the way around. And then you have this hollow that's been cut out underneath it that goes up inside. And it's interesting to me that from Kahran Tepe in Anatolia, Turkey, they've got just uncovered, you know, this is the new uh, Gobekli Tepe, or, you know, so, or Gobekli Tepe. It's the new one, you know, basically it's the new site, same thing. They've, you know, excavated this stone head sticking out. And when I look at everything from the jawline, the line coming back from the eye, the line coming back from the cheekbone, look at the way the lips are. And then I look underneath the chin of that and I see a hollowed out area that goes up identical to this thing that we've got over here in New Mexico. And it, 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 it took me, you know, pretty hard when I saw that. But go on to the next picture. Well, before we do that, um, have you seen the images from the Well of Souls in uh, 
Tiwanaku. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this this reminds me of of that exactly. Yeah, because it's in a the way they plug in and the way they plug in with their neck back into the into the cut and kind of protrude like that. Right. Yeah. And the way the faces are made and so forth. Fascinating. Here's now, another. Now here's actually, if we look at the very top up there, you're going to see that's the he the head, but we're down below at a lower perspective looking up and you can see the hollow set. And now this stuff, like I said, was meant to be seen by the elect, not the average, but then you'll see this crescent moon shape which means subterranean. It means nighttime or when the, the realm of the night or the darkness or the underground. And so, and below that for verification to show that, yes, this is a head. Yes, the cut under it. Yes, the crescent. We have a cut notch. And go ahead and go to the next picture. I'm still looking for the crescent moon. Where is that? Robert? So that's just in between what would be the head at the very top. And then you have the, the the cut notch visible in the lower, and then that oh, set right there. Yeah, it's right. I see it direct in the center. Yeah, and I so just want to get my brain around that. Yeah, and but they'll always they'll always verify. So there's several ways of verification. That's either a cut notch, a cut round hole, or propped rocks or wedges of rocks, and so we'll we'll see those. So go ahead and go to the next one. So next one. this is a close up of the of the cut notch. Now you'll notice is they had a chisel. And this is a, a chert type of sandstone. It's actually a lot harder than like your regular softer sandstones. Um, it's almost to chert, which is granulated quartz, um, extremely hard. And But you'll see the chisel marks as they chiseled this. Now, this is ancient because we see a cellular growth of orange lichen as well as some of these other. Now, these particular lichen growths take a long time. They're slow duration growth. The orange takes up, they've said, 10,000 to 50,000 years to get a, an inch, a uh, cell an inch across. And what we're looking at in there is three eighths to a half inch, something like that. And so we, we, we potentially could be looking at eight or 10,000 years that this was chiseled with a tool out. And so that's pretty neat, but let's go on and we'll get, we're going to go where this goes. We're going to follow this basically, but not in too much detail. All right. There you go. So on the same outcrop, so to speak, which is the directory, um, with a little bit of imagination, you can look up at the top back center rock outcrop in this photo, and you can see a profile of a head looking to the right. And again, it's got its chin on what would look like a fist. And what we're again looking at is the same thing. It's telling you what to contemplate. And there's a little bit of specifics here that I can't go into. I, I could, but there's no supportive detail um, about what it's indicating. But again, behind the mind of this would be behind the eyes there what would be that profile uh kind of an alien looking head which <clears throat> is another cutout with a slot entry that again is another scale model of, an, of a shaft now if we look down in front of it in the foreground of the photo we see honestly what looks like the skull of maybe a triceratops or something being shown in stone and that's cut really dramatically all the way around that's a really cool thing and it doesn't take much imagination to fit that in as well. Let's go to the next picture, please. <clears throat> there we go. So this is the location five miles away where they're telling you to go. And I just wanted to show some examples. I think this one's also cropped. Um, that might be better to show if we can. And then you Working can, on it. Okay, and then you can. Uh, just a moment. You know, the computer does that automatically to fill in blank spaces. Yeah, no, there that's that's good. So you'll see here that this is actually a dolmen, and it's probably four or five feet tall, and it has three small supporting rocks on a small outcrop of rock, and all right. that all that solid rock. So nature didn't put this there either. And when you get a good look at it, it's actually a lion looking up to the left, and so. And it's like an African lion. It's not like, and this is just in profile, but um, it's not like what you know we have mountain lions and cougars, and uh, which is really unique. A lot of the animals, they you know, we see elephants, we see all kinds of stuff that you'd only associate with Africa or India or somewhere else. Um, but this is an obvious one of the trail markers when we get onto the place to where it was described in the last directory. So now that we're here, we're just going to show you 
probably for each one of these pictures there's a dozen to a hundred more that are similar that we just don't have time to show so go ahead and go to the next one there you go so this is and this is fine so this is another monument that is following this trail that is marked on top of this and this is uh the winged horse so the story of the winged horse or pegasus goes back as far as history goes back um, you can find renditions of it that that predate the historical period basically even the verbal and before writing this is something that went on around the world um, so it's very interesting and we see this incorporated here and not just in one place but we see pegasus the winged horse um, in several locations in this area which is crazy because horse is transportation winged is flight in this case the folded wings make a heart again for the same very same reason as we saw the heart before and then the eyes make a kind of a cross and there's more information kind of encoded into the points and shape for distance and what you're going to find and stuff but we can't really go into too much detail okay let's go on to the next one there you go okay so at, on this air place um there are some dwellings that were located and they're not built like normal houses they're built like flintstone houses and i'm coming out of one right here and it's there's that that door plate is between eight inches and a foot thick but it's about eight to nine feet tall and so it's a very very thin very very large plate and it's put up to block the front and then over my left shoulder to to the right of me to us is uh, an edge of that large uh, peak shaped block and then it sits on a cut ledge. So there's a cut ledge about four to five inches wide that goes the whole length back there, about 10, 15 feet. And that sits on that cut ledge. And so it forms a large room inside behind this. And then they have another subterranean room on to the left. And inside that was pottery and, you know, some, uh, some really cool, almost braided clay pottery, hand pinched, really neat. And then, um, and they call it Paleolithic. So they say this stuff's eight or 9,000 years old. So now, um, now up, up above this to what would be my in the photo right or the left in the photo, you see a long geometric, what looks to be cut stone. And that's what that is. That's exactly perfectly equilateral. And that stands for a moth, mouth monument. And the mouth means down to the right. And so they're telling you, you can go into a dwelling down to the right. And then there are other stone here who could actually be picked up and placed over that set. And you'd barely even know you'd had anything in it. Okay. And this, so whoever was doing the work, this is how they would set up like a short term structure, basically. But that rock on top weighs probably 120 tons. So let's go on to the next. And yet they... And yet no. they, they lifted it somehow and put it in place. On a, yeah, on a cut ledge. And so they had yeah. to cut that ledge and then get it on that ledge without messing the ledge up and without messing it up. And it's almost it's almost exactly flat. You know, it's not leaning or whatever. It's It, it feels so sketchy to be in there, but you know by the volume and size of the rock that it's not going to move. But it's right. amazing. But it, it looks crazy. I mean. Wow. All right. Next one. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, so this is at an entirely new, another site. Um, but what we're doing is we're going to go a few this so we can show some of the similarities and we're going to create this circle. So on this glyph panel, on the left-hand side, you see a very odd character. And on the right hand, far right-hand side, you see two pretty normal characters. And what they are showing us here is most of the characters aren't shown with like their toes and stuff, the, the humans. But they're showing you on the right guys over here. They're both holding rods. And and he has five toes. And he's to show you he's a human. He's got five toes. And then on the extreme left, those figures on that side of the panel and the one that's blatantly being shown to us has three toes. And so they're showing the difference between the five-toe guys and the three-toe guys. And directly in the center between them, it's kind of hard to make out, is a mammoth. And this is going to show you the age of these glyphs because when mammoths were running out, so eight to 10,000 years ago at minimum um, that we had mammoth here anyway. Um, and so we're going to see some, another glyph panel next that is next to this panel. Um, and then we'll go back to components of this one. But it's going to show potentially 
uh, correlation globally. Not just the three-toed reptoid looking guy, but uh, go ahead and go to the next pick. Where's the next one? Oh, that's out of order. That should not be there. Um, let's see what the next one is, Jerry. Okay, I see what happened here. Let me find it. <clears throat> yeah, I did. It placed them out of order, all right. Yeah, we were in order up to that, that point. Was, uh, yeah, here we go, this one. Yeah. Okay, so this one you're going to want to uncrop if you can, please. All right. There you go. Okay, so now we can see the whole character. And what this is is the siren. Um, there, some of the oldest use of it was, of course, before the Greek siren mythology. Um, it goes all the way back to uh, Samaria, um, where you have the, the fishtail goddess with the split tail. And it's, they call her the split tail mermaid or the dual tail mermaid. Um, but it is it, later on in usage, like in the Greeks, even early Greek, this is, was a symbol for the siren, which was meant for the dual nature of, or it meant unity, or it meant uh, fulfillment, um, or it meant to, uh, to long for, to make you long for. So what you're longing for to find fulfillment, whatever. But the users of this were not native, the Native Americans in the, whole, in the most part. Now, I want you to notice that you have that symbol as a symbol for basically who was doing or around. And then up to the right, you have what looks like basically an orb with a porthole, and then it has direction marks behind it as it's streaking. And then you have what looks like a four-armed bird-like creature above that uh, that's probably a symbol for flight um, is what we can see. And then go on to the next picture. Please, right. please, thank you. Now you're going to see some of these are the historical renditions of the very same goddess, so to speak. So this is the siren or the dual tail mermaid. It's all over the world, and it was used in extremely deep antiquity. Now, what's interesting is on the upper right here, I'd like you to look, or first, on the lower, lower right, I want you to look, and it's not a female at this point. And the oldest renditions, it wasn't. And then if we go to the very far upper right, you see it's not even human. So that now we begin to get more, and the one even to the left of it, more of the type of triangular head, um, more the ET aspect look to this same iconog iconography. So let's go on to the next one. There you go. So this is the character from the extreme right on the glyph panel that I showed you. So he's not the person, he's something else. And they went to great care. This is the best cut glyph anywhere out there. And it's all by itself and it's large and in charge. And um, I think we even have a, go on to the next one. I think we even have a better photo of it, Jerry. There you go. And so again, you can see, so if we pay close attention, they made great effort to make an elongated neck, a reptoid shaped head, and then three toy, three toes. And the three digits and those other features can be found all over the world, from ancient China, ancient Turkey, um, South America. I know you've probably seen, Jerry, uh, some of the stuff from South America that has to do with the three-toed uh, Nazca remains and things found from the reptoid-looking guys. Um, oh, sure. It's, and, and deep in the uh, eastern Amazon, uh, uh, or it goes right up to the mountains. Right. And this is this is basically exactly what we're seeing. It's the same character, but we know from the glyph panel there's a mammoth on it. So we're looking at a date of, of eight to ten thousand somewhere in there um, that, that it should range from the last of the mammoths, so to speak. And so here we have interaction between what look like Native Americans and then these creatures that far back, let's say eight thousand years, nine thousand years to ten thousand years. OK, so let's keep going. All right. So here's very difficult to see. There's another picture of this that's following that I'll that'll help to explain this, but it's going to show them both. On the far left, you see what looks like kind of a, it's actually a uh, an upside down bowl shape, and then it, you can see ca carved on the rock there. And this is at night with a flashlight. And so on the far right, you can kind of see what looks like a bird or a raptor. And so you have a vertical line and it's pecked in and he has a kind of a tail and a, and a head to the left. And then there's a dotted line that goes all the way 
from that upside down bowl looking thing all the way to it looks like a raptor form. And then go to the next photo. Um, there you go. Okay, now this is the same one during the day. And you can see there's three marks. And that, that's interesting because I've found it in a few places with that same symbol above it. And, um, but you'll see that that cone or that uh, the bowl shape what looks like uh, you know some of the craft that are actually depicted and we'll get more into that in a minute and then you've got this pecked in kind of lightning bolty thing runs all the way over to this raptor form and mm -hmm. this is something we'll see repeated um, at other sites even a little better than this but it is a repeating motif when we find the reptoids or the Sumerian icon iconography um, that keeps popping up at these North American sites is this little scene here where this thing that apparently is in the air that's dome shaped is shooting something squiggly at what looks like a raptor on the ground. Okay, let's, let's move on. There you go. So as we proceed, when we use the monuments from this site, we proceed, we come in, this is one of the monuments we come to and it's it's verification. It's really neat one actually because it could not have got itself here. There's no each rock we see under it is also on smaller support rocks, and then that rock that's beneath it on the right side of the pedestal is on three. Same thing. And then if we look at the pinch point up above, there's also one rock in there, and then it sits at the back. It's the most precarious thing you've ever seen. And then the block down below is a large geometric square block, unlike anything else again. And it's also put in a position where you can't really see it from that too many places. And then let's go on from here. Now, following these monuments is how we get to locations to where in the past that there's been major treasures recovered um, and things but what we're following is older. Um, these sites were known about by the Aztecs and by some of the early inhabitants of North America and as well as some of the later priests and such. Now, what we're looking at here is actually a stone rendition of a box turtle or terrapin. And in the shell, there are four inclusions with one missing. And then when we look down below him in the pedestal, there are also four inclusions with one missing. So the likelihood of a repetition of four iron concretions with that one gone and then below four iron concretions with that one gone, the odds of that plus that we're looking for turtles, triangles, and other things like this that are made in stone, um, you put them together and they're astronomical that you're going to see this. And let's go on to the next one. All righty. Thank you, Jerry. There we are. Okay, so here we can see the 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 concretions and what they are is they're actually there is weathering around them but they're actually placed into these cuts and into these holes and which is really really cool when we think about it because this is actually what they're what exactly what it says the turtle and they're giving you uh mathematical information and this is thousands of years old okay let's keep going all right so i told you or asked you that before to remember the mask and the shape of the mask. And the stone in front of us is a few things at once. So it's meant to be seen from a little bit of a distance, actually. And I know this is cropped, so it even looks closer. Um, but it this if you can see the similarity on the left side there, you have the circle, which is the eye, and then you have the mouth down below. And you have that sloped back, flat look to the mask. Um, this is basically the same type or it represents the same mask we saw at the previous site. And it also makes a triangle, which is divided into a lower triangle on the right. And both there's two hollow triangles. So the lower triangle stone on the right has a hollow cut out the center. And then there's another triangular cut making a shadow below the circle. And what that stands for is two entrances. And it stands for two caves. And one has a shaft entry. And so, um, but, but just remember the mask component of this in the triangle. And let's move on if we can. Here we go. So if we follow this to the culmination of this, it actually takes us to this stone pyramid. And this is as far as they want you to go on the trail. And then this, the location they're talking about is within a uh, distance of this rock itself. So this sets kind of a UTM data point.
And this is actually a stone pyramid. It's four sided. Um, and you know, you just don't, you can go for a million miles and not find anything natural like that. So, and to, to make the point that they're not only, it's not only not natural, but it's, it's repeated. I just don't, can't show the pyramids along the trail for due to time, but let's move on. All right. Uh, this one. Yeah. So this is also, um, been rotated Jerry. So, all right, let's see what we got. Here. If we can rotate that clockwise, this is a pretty important one. All right, let's see. <clears throat> let's see if this is it here in just a second. How about that? That is it. Thank you very much, Jerry. So what we're seeing here is the same domed craft. The ones you see on the right side is an example of it. And it shows two protrusions, basically, um, at the bottom. And they're, well, they'd be up in, up in the craft. But, um, and then you see the craft in action. Up, so up left of that is the same domed craft and then it has what looks like lightning or energy coming down and then it has what looks like a raptor or a dinosaur below that so again we have this is a totally different site a couple of hundred miles from the other one but related all these are related and you have the same basic dome shape firing something squiggly at what appears to be a raptor type dinosaur or something on the ground and then let's go ahead and move on We go. So this is another at that site raptor, um, and this site's real particular. When they draw a bird, it looks like a bird. When they draw a deer, it looks like a deer. Different kinds of birds you can you can recognize. I mean, they were, did things very accurately. And the the stumpy legs, the big feet, the the thick neck and head, and then the position of the tail. So somebody might say, oh, that's a roadrunner. And in a sense, it could be. But they draw birds like roadrunners, and they don't draw legs that are muscular, heavy legs whatsoever. They draw tiny little thinny bird legs. Um, and we know the, the bottom picture here is a T-Rex, but it's a depiction of a T-Rex young. So most of the, we know actually T-Rex had larger muscle volume in the leg sections than this. They were actually more accurate to what we see in the glyph. The interesting thing is that position was not was not understood until recently so even in the 70s and early 80s they didn't depict dinosaur or the raptors with the tail's head high and hard and erect until more recent studies showed that like t-rexes and allosaurus stuff had mostly a rigid tail with maybe the tip being flexible with which they used as a constant counterbalance and so in order to dip down they had to raise it up like that because it was basically rigid so it's more accurate than what we understood as raptors were until the 80s. But go ahead. Let's go to another one. So this is another glyph. And this is interesting because it shows what looks like a giant bird. Now you can see a bird. Now you see thin legs and you see three toes and you see a bird body and a big bird neck. And you see what looks like a bird that's got a guy in its, head, in its, in its beak. And you see another bird on the ground. Okay. So or I mean another man on the ground. Now what they're showing you is here's the bird, here's the scale size of the bird. This And the birds are dangerous. And the guy's got obviously a bow and a projection in front of him, but he's he's not using it against the bird. So he's been picked off or whatever while hunting or whatever. So, but we're showing scale. Now let's move on to the next photo and we'll see how, how big were birds just 12,000, 15,000 years ago. Well, that's how big they were. So the bird we look at to the upper left, number two here, is in extent um, very similar to the bird that was depicted in the glyph. Um, and so with a, with a more long slender neck and a longer beak and being that big. Now we know we had birds here that were 13 feet tall, which would even be bigger than number three that were here at the end of the last ice age. Okay, so and then we here we got glyphs showing giant bird and a guy um, just straight up. So let's go, and we have, since we have mammoths and things, we know these uh, old glyphs, these are eight to 10,000 years. It's a potential that giant bird could have been 
the real viewpoint. So let's move on to the next one. There you go. So here we go again, what looks like similar type of giant bird, but if you look real good, it looks like there's a guy riding on its back. Now, this is one of the coolest ones we see because there's a lot of these big birds and people, but this is the only one where you've got what looks like a guy on the bird's back. And that's pretty crazy because in South America, they show, as you know, uh, glyphs of big birds with guys riding on the big birds and yeah, on, that's right. and cut on the rocks and on, on the pots and stuff. So it's like a, you know, a, a repeating motif to what's in South America. But let's go ahead and move on. There you go. So in this picture, we're seeing a model of a Parasaurolophilus held up against a petroglyph of a Parasaurolophilus, or what appears to be. It's anatomically correct. And again, the position we have of the model is the old rendition. What we see in the glyph <clears throat> is actually the more accurate rendition. So let's move on to the next photo and we'll see that. So this, this is the latest, the modern rendition based on what we know of morphology of how they stood and held their tails. And if we look, this matches the glyph identical. So in the 70s, 80s, and still making toys into 2000 and some, 2010, 15, we're still using the old depiction, and that's not how they stood. This is how they stood. And so it's interesting that the glyphs are more accurate than our understanding of dinosaurs right up until the 70s and 80s. Okay, so, and we're still showing them wrong. So let's move on to the next one. Okay, here you see kind of the, the prize. And these are actually what looks like to be and is marked as an ancient tomb site of some great heroic character or another. And these dinosaurs are on the front of it. One of the tomb sites has been opened, the boulders moved, and the cave's empty. This one has never been discovered, so it's still intact. Whatever's in there is in there. Now, it's interesting because when you look up to the upper left, Above the main glyph, you see some pretty sketchy things. You see what looks like a bomb, what was in Sumeria and the, and the, the Sumerian uh, cylinder seals that show what looks like a bomb. And you see what looks like a lightning bolt, but it's a serpent with a rattlesnake's tail, which stands for frequency. Um, and the snake itself for electricity, so the frequency of electricity. So it's, it's interesting what what these glyphs are repeating and showing. But more importantly is what Tara is looking at here. Um, you could probably see it from here. Um, it's no bird. It is very large uh, type of dinosauric. Uh, I would say Allosaurus, T-Rex, uh, Carnosaur, something like that. Um, potentially Carnosaur because that's the Cretaceous. And most everything we see fits stuff or, or even T-Rex, the, the late Cretaceous or early Cretaceous. And so there's, yeah, Jerry's got a little zoom in of it. And we see what looks like a raptor above that um, of some form or another, maybe in the distance. And what's really unique is you have the little arms sticking out the front. Uh, let's go to the next picture, Jerry. I think you have an even better one. All right. <clears throat> there you go. Yeah. So here you can see there's an eye. The whole head, the snout, um, and actually, I don't know if this one shows it as good as the last one. I guess it doesn't, but it looks like he's got a guy hanging out of his mouth, and his arms are holding onto the guy, and it's biting him in the head. Um, and can we go ahead and go back to that other one real quick? Sure. There you go. So now you can see it kind of there a little bit better, but the guy has feet, and it's a torso, and he has arms, and but he looks like. It looks like it has, looks like both of them basically have a guy in their mouth uh, hanging by the head. Uh, top one as well, you have arms and legs hanging down, and then the bottom one, he's hanging straight down. And But the eye and the nose and nostril and stuff are kind of cut in pretty cool, the eye especially. So, okay, so, and this is, I guess, Allosaurus or whatever. And to show the same thing in position as the erect tail, um, the body geometry, the body uh, the whole nine yards. And I think the top one may be one of those big birds eating on somebody and because it has bird like feet, but this bottom one is shown with in a sense, pointy feet, but not, not thin. And, you know, you can see how thick the legs are, the difference. So it's more accurate to a large raptor, like a Allosaurus or Carnosaur. Let's go ahead and go on. 
So this is a Tyrannosaurus Rex to show the scale um, of a human to it, and it matches, basically. Uh, so does the overall body, the way it's holding its body, and the way it sits. And we move on again to another slide of this. There you go. Okay. So this is actually out of sequence, but we'll move on. So at the same, because we're going to close a gap here now. So at the same location um, where we thought we had maybe a domed craft that was blasting dinosaurs, well, we show a raptor eating guys. We show uh, several other things like that and some very definitive glyphs that should indicate dinosaurs. And here we have what if you drew it, if you went to, you know, to a, an astronomical um course somewhere or in the you know space sciences and you drew this they'd say oh yeah that's a wormhole that's a that's a vortex of plasma and ionized vo vortex and then the line in between the two and then another ionized vortex and so let's look at the next picture so here's another edition of the next picture not sure why it's in black and white but i'm good with that and so it has what looks like an open mouth of a serpent ejecting something and that's like the serpent mound where you have the open mouth and then the object in front of it and what this is indicating is probably just that it's probably wormhole travel faster than light travel because if you actually look the line in between the glit the the spirals are made real thick and heavy the line in between is almost a dotted line it's like you're not there like you go into it there you come out of it over here then you you come out of the vortex or the serpent um, of energy. Okay, and so let's move on. Now things are going to heat up a little bit. So here we have a glyph that is a depiction of the craft itself and the occupant of the craft. And the cross is very cool because it's actually the winged staff. So they show the staff with the serpents. And then they, sh then they show the winged staff with the circle on top. So this is really cool because we all know where those come from, right? Now, it's interesting, though, is you have to really memorize the shape of what the craft you're seeing. And it's at an angle, so it's actually symmetrical. So you've got a triangular domed craft, or what appears to be, with two small protrusions on the bottom. And then that dual line triangular doorway in it so let's move on to the next picture uh just a moment okay um, here we go now you're gonna look that's the same glyph there's your domed triangular craft with the doorway with the two lines and then there's the same two square protrusions at the bottom and if you want to go back and forth you can jerry but it's it's virtually identical except for the um, the little horizontal lines just above the door there that, that differentiate the cone. But other than that, I mean, everything is line for line, same geometry, right to exact. Okay. It sure is. Now, what this is, is these are the plates, the real ones, from Jalisco, Mexico. And remember, Jerry, I was talking to you about how the waveform of the plasma energy and that you right. have a curved sine wave and then you have a square wave out front on the same electrical arc. And that's what gives you the ratio that creates the distortion in time space that you use to move forward and go aloft. And that's what we see here. We see them in a large craft, which would be our Tic Tac or our cylindrical UFO. And in one of the bays behind the operator station, who we can see to the right there, is the, his smaller scout craft, which is the triangular-shaped one. And like right. I described before, we see the square wave form. Up above that is a model of the distortion. And then that transmits down below to a, a curvy sine wave. And that's what you're getting. That's what's operating the, the craft. That's what's allowing it. And then, of course, above it, for so they can express to you what you're looking at, you see... A, pl uh, a planet with rings, no doubt, which they should not have known about. And then you see another, maybe the moon or another, the, stu the sun or, or celestial body. Now, mm -hmm. interesting part. Remember the sloped mask that we saw earlier? Right. Do you see the, the pilot to this craft here sitting in the seat? Yeah, I do. 
That's the mask. Okay, so what we're doing is we're closing gaps here. So we've taken the ancient glyph sites that show and are directed to by masks, by rabbits, things like that, but that show dinosaurs and people. And then you show a domed craft shooting the dinosaurs. And then you show the same craft uh, when drawn in detail is the identical craft, what's been featured as a craft on the plates in Jalisco, Mexico with the a character as a pilot with the same mask. Wow. Now yeah, so we're, I see that. we're linking locations over a vast area here. I'm not <laughs> sure how many miles it is from Jalisco to these to these locations in New Mexico, but it's considerable. Um now let's let's go ahead and move on and we'll even go farther. Right. Now this is another visual of a plate and he's holding on his back so he's the power that carries the plate. So he's symbolizing these, these plates are authentic. These are the real ones. So he's symbolizing the power that carries it and moves it forward. And remember how the square wave was on the right hand side in front of, and then the curvy wave was below. Okay. So his headdress is reminiscent of the spiked square wave. And then his arm and the curve is the model of the sine wave below. Same thing. Now the craft is seen in even more detail with what a panel and what would we would call an emissions panel or emitter panel. And then on the sides of the door wave, you see the square wave, right? This is really mm -hmm. important. So this is a better rendition of the craft. Now let's go ahead and move forward. Right. Now we see the two sides of the previous tablet and in comparison to the bottom right there, same craft, same ship. And he's showing you, the other side is basically that same ship from the top side, and it's showing you the emitter locations. So remember when I was telling you about the two uh, crosses, and then you had two systems, and then they offset each other to create the field distortion, and there's right. what you're looking at. One is a, a, a curve. That's your curve sine wave. The other is a point. And that's your square wave. Okay, so now down to the bottom left, we actually see a model of that unit and even as so much as to be showing the waveform at the top and how the distortion is set off to one side and then you see the form going around the base which you can't see all of you see portion of a square wave and then it curves so each one has a curve and a square to it same thing so and then again you see that plate so let's move on to the next one there you go. here's another model from the caves there. And this one you might want to uncrop uh, just because it'll help with it being blurry. I don't know how hard that is. Well, that is uncropped. Okay. All right. Then what you're going to, so that's as good as we get. So you see a little, you see in the upper left, you see the same thing, the, the triangle and what the porthole looking deal is your emitter. And then you have some points coming down from the top. Then you have the curve. Okay. So all that same waveform is replicated again in this one. And this is a different form of ship. And if we take the top off, it actually has a little alien sitting inside the top as well. And then it has a door to the back that shows you the guy in this position. Now, you almost need to remember this position as well because they're showing you the position to actually sit inside the craft. So see the bottom right there? See the guy in a reclining position with the bowl in his hands? Mm, yeah, I see that. It so that reminds me of uh, the call. Yeah, or Chetzen Itza, where the main temple has the guy there with the ball and he's looking sideways, with the bowl and he's looking sideways. So when they oh. say that's the sacrificial bowl, that's where you put your, your the hearts and the blood and whatnot. So, But this actually predates all of that by about 7,000 years. So this is where they got it all, but it's, it got changed. So... Yeah. Go ahead. It's like uh, it's like uh, Pascal. Is it Pascal's tomb? It's um, I've been there a few times. I think it's Pascal's tomb. Anyway, it's it's the, the guy is laying on his back like he has these controls in his hand in that tomb. Yeah, same this thing. This looks very much like it. Yeah, and if you look where this character's face would be, you'll also notice a square wave in front and a curved wave below his face. See, that's his intention. That's that's the way it works. That's the power that he's putting forth. Okay, so let's on, move on to the next one. There you go. So, so there's no confusion. These are actually the radiocarbon analysis report of the adhesive 
used in the creation of some of these artifacts. Now, there's thousands of fake ones out there. They're being sold every day. They're not real. These are real. So, and this is, uh, I believe this came out of the University of Arizona AMS Laboratory. Okay, so this is the actual paperwork to this collection that we're looking at. So, go, this is the radiocarbon dating. So, let's go ahead and go to the next page for the results. So, as we see here, the results are 7513 to 7372 BC to 7521 I'm sorry, 7521 to 7954 BC. We're talking 9,000, on, on average, 9,700 years old. Wow. But what is that? These are the, these are, these are the artifacts from Jalisco, Mexico, right? But what are the glyph panels that I just showed you that show these three-toed reptoid-looking guys with conical craft emitting radiation onto what look like dinosaurs, right? Right. And yeah. these ages have to be between 8,000 and 10,000 because of the mammoth and the other animals, okay? And we're looking at the same dates here, the same stuff, the same craft. About all we're lacking is the dinosaur reference, right, to the Jalisco artifacts. This is real data. So everyone else is seeing the picture and going, ah, oh, those aren't real. Those are whatever. This is the radio. If they were hoaxed, they were hoaxed 9,700 years ago because the organic adhesive beneath inlay stones, they actually did do destructive work on these to get that, is 9,700 years old. And that's well established. So let's move on to the next picture. All right. There you go. Okay. This is actually rotated, but it really doesn't matter. So what we're looking at is uh, small trinkets that are made of jasper, which is extremely hard. There's no tool marks in them. Um, they're absolutely accurate and beautiful, down to some pretty high detail. And in the upper one there, what's it? What is it? It's a guy in the same position as the pilot, same position as Chichen Itza, same position. You said uh, where was the other one at? Um, he's uh, laid Pascal's back. Pascal's tomb. Pascal's tomb. And what's he got? He's got a bowl in it. But what's in the bowl? Turquoise. Right, not not a heart yeah. or blood or anything. A turquoise. Now, turquoise is anhydrous aluminum, so turquoise is actually a source of aluminum. So, it makes you wonder why somebody that looks like a little alien dude would ha would think a bowl of turquoise is so important. But if you're flying around aerial craft, maybe that's a big deal, right? So, what we know about these artifacts, though, is they came out of the collection. They are nine thousand seven hundred years old. Two, the oldest, oldest pull on them was 11,400. Okay, now, you're looking at the same character, believe it or not. On the right-hand side, he has a mask on. That's the mask. It's the wedge-shaped mask. And on the left side is the same character, basically with no mask or pressure suit. Okay, and in his hand, he holds a disc with teeth around the edge of the disc. And on the right side. And what I didn't now see on the bowl that also has a lip with a uh, lip with uh, deviations in it with a turquoise mm -hmm. in the center. And then he, what he's holding has deviations as well, like they're toothed, like a mechanism. And so right. there are some ancient depictions that show characters, even in the Kimberley Ranges, Australia, that are holding what looks like a disc with a toothed edge. And similar, same thing he's holding on to. It's almost like, even matter of fact, the jade disc from China, um, they have finer teeth, but they have very fine teeth all the way around the outer. And they have some that even fit into what look like a, a jade disc player. And they fit down into them and they have teeth around the outside. Like, like in antiquity, it used to be a device that would rotate like our discs today. So, but what we've done basically even here is closed a full circle because... We're looking at turquoise in this picture, right? Well, mm -hmm. the sites I showed you earlier that show the same craft, same characters, the whole nine yards, um, are near the world famous oldest Chachuitl, the most, the biggest, oldest turquoise mines uh, anywhere in the Americas. Matter of fact, the turquoise in South America that was being used all over the place, most of it came from Chachawedal mines they've identified. 
So they were hauling it all the way down there. Here's this connection. And those mines go back activity 8,000 years. They're the oldest mines in North America. So there we go again. There's this 8,000, 9,000 year time frame. There's mines and there's these characters that are from above that were working with the people, taking out the things that were working with and coveting turquoise. So it's interesting that we actually have these guys at the turquoise mines as well. Um, and so it's a full loop. It's this full connection of the metals they were going after and what they, they, what they were doing and how they were interacting with people and what the people were doing. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. All right. So here again, <clears throat> a Lisco artifact, um, crude. But this one as well shows the domed craft, just with the triangular doorway, um, same as the ones we saw beaming those guys. And then it shows a man reclining, heads on the left side, but he has a glowing orb in his hands as he reclines. And go ahead to the next one. All right, just uh, getting it postured right here. Okay. All right. There you go. And so this one does appear to be cropped, I think. Um, nope, it's not. It's not. Okay. Well, that's, we cut that picture off a little. So this is one of the guys, um, and he's in what looks like a sarcophagus. And there's a feather and steps on, on his girdle, and which would signify flight, and then the square wave. There's what looks almost like a Maltese cross, but that's a template form on the lid to the right. And then you have the feet uh, in progression upwards. And so then you have the folded arms. And in this case, just pay very close attention uh, to the folded arms and the being itself. And let's go on to the next one. All right. Here we go. There you are. Now... Same character on the far right, arms in a different position, but they're in a sense really not because only one arm is changed, but it's still symmetrical to the other arm from the original cross. And then if you look at the symbols up above, those same symbols that are on his conical head are also on the, the other uh, artifacts with the turquoise. And I know because I own both those that were in my hand. I showed you I have them here with me. So um, they were sent to me by the f original finders so that we could validate what they were finding and it helped them to explore as well. But what I want to show here, though, is from Altai, the South Urals, Bolivia, Mongolia, and China all show characters in the same position as the Mexico version, except the Mexico version we know is 9,700 years old, which basically predates the rest, except... Jerry, look where the middle one is in Bolivia. You recognize yeah. that? That's, oh, I've been all over that thing. That's the well, that's the lowered portion of that building, right? That's called with the heads all yeah. the way around it. And that's one yeah, of the, the well of souls. The well of souls. And you said the head that we had in New Mexico, which is associated with these alien guys or whatever. And then we look at the alien guy here and we look at the depiction that's sitting there, well of souls in Bolivia there. Okay. And it's the same. So you, now you're seeing the connection of where all this came from. Yeah, and I don't know if anyone knows this or even if you know this, but uh, this figure here in the center from Bolivia and also uh, a few of the other ones that are quite extraordinary down there, they have two left hands. That's super interesting. See, and on the a original Alien, it doesn't really show... Um, well, you know, if you go by the length of fingers, so does that one. Or it That's actually what I was noticing. It has two of the same hands. It's not, but they're two right hands, aren't they? Um. No, they're two. They're two left hands. Two left. Two left. Yeah. yeah, I'd have to see it to really validate yeah. that. But you know that really tall statue at Tiwanaku. Uh, there's one that's like I don't know. My God, it's 15, 20 feet tall. It has two left hands. And the one that's standing out in the field, it's just covered with glyphs. It also has two left hands, as does this one. You have a picture of I mean, we We did a complete documentary on this and studied, you know, all of these statues very closely. There's a couple of other things about these statues. It's just absolutely fascinating. 
when they were found, they were found partially buried in the sand. The part that was exposed, the rock is vitrified. There you it's go. It's sandstone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and let's let's talk about that for a second because we're looking at what these conical shaped things that we've established a bunch through other associated uh, uh, portrayals of them as craft, and they look like they're firing energy weapons. And then you have vitrified sites that would take plasma to generate the forms of heat that we're looking at, like lightning temperature. Oh, this this was this was not lightning. No, I, but I mean that hot. It would have to be as hot as yeah. plasma in order to do that. In other words, a metals foundry, people don't realize, you're looking at vitrification of rocket, a lot of this at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're looking at yeah. iron melting at 17 to 2100. Um, you know, you're you're looking at twice the temperature that it takes to basically melt iron is what this stuff's being exposed to. They people think, yeah. oh, vitrification, oh, that's a fire. They stacked wood against it. No, they not to do that. They no. do. Um, no. It takes They're, plasma, yeah. or it takes some form of of arcing or something like that, electrical or plasma in nature to get those temperatures, just period. If if it was a fire set on it, there would be carbon embedded into it that you could actually date. Right. But it doesn't, these statues don't. Right. This is actually exposed to this 3,000 plus degree heat. Right. Uh, we've been following that story and investigating that story now for, my God, 10 years. Right. See, when you would take that statue and comp compare it to the one on the far right here and then go to the heritage with those and what it shows in those, um, you begin to get a possibility inferred through this stuff of what those what actually did that, what produced those temperatures. Um, if we're looking at an interstellar craft or interplanetary or even, even terrestrial, but we're using anti-gravity and... and um, basically the potential of zero point or the counter rotating by natural field. Um, uh, you're talking infinite power and energy weapons. And well, if, if that's the case, true. there we are. We show energy weapons being used against dinosaurs and we have the Hopis tell the Stales that the heroes showed up and they, they took out the dinosaurs, the Kachina. Um, and then we'd start beginning to tie all these things together, who these characters were. And in the other versions here, we very we see easily how Anglo-Saxon and other even Chinese use and stuff inferred these characters to more of their own people, um, and right. with, and and put uh, their anthropomorphic, uh, um, you know, supposition of themselves into this. And it's funny because if you look at all the depictions, now what we see in Bolivia doesn't have, but the other ones hold a knife in their hand as a weapon, so. And, and then it holds a cup, and the cup usually means knowledge or of holding. And so you had the dual nature there. So there's the knowledge of or the weapon of, and that's that's similar as well to the way we see the dual nature of, of like nuclear physics, where you know uh, it can be used for medicine or it can be used for weapons. Um, so it's it's similar to that. So it's like the the same thing to the dual nature field they're using with the craft, and it was being utilized pre-flood and even after. Um, uh, has a dual nature. I mean, you could you could fix the world with it, or you could break the world with it. Well, it, part of my reasoning for going to Tiwanaku originally was because, um, what was it called? Um, oh, the fellow that wrote the book. <laughs> I don't know. Remember that uh, my mind's foggy at the moment. But we went down there take, to take a look at this, and sure enough, there are places on the doorway of the sun where an energy beam has hit it right uh, we could we could do a whole show on what we found out in tiwanaku and maybe i should at some point in the future because it, it what we found down there was absolutely spectacular well let's uh let's go ahead and move on to the next picks here and see what we got so there you go. this is another rendition of uh of a craft it's real similar to the other one you see the same forms it's it's actually not the same one but you see it's nearly identical um, and then um, let's go ahead and we'll just cruise on. All right. There's your next one. Yeah. And so here's your guy. And now what's he holding in his hand? That is actually a mask. So 
he's there with his with his mask in his hands, so to speak. It's not to scale, but to show to show what's going on. So, and he has you can see it's kind of cool because you can see the bindings on his legs to his boots. Um, he's still in his pressure suit or uniform, just with his mask just off. And as we see in the glyphs on the plates and things, this is the position at which they piloted their craft. And as well, like you said, you know, um, as seen in other other places in that position as well. So let's go on. There you go. So this is uh, down where these things were being pulled out in tunnels up to 600 feet deep below an unpublicized pyramid in Jalisco that they have actually dark carbon dated um, the stuff in the tunnels and stuff in their dug tunnels and they've carbon dated them to uh, 25,000 years. So they predate the artifact collections and stuff that are actually inside them, which is neat. That's why we have a range from 9,700 to 11,400 on artifacts overall. So they were continually depositing them beneath this ancient pyramid really deep. And so let's move on. There you go. Yeah. Now, what did I say? Well, the only thing we're missing is dinosaurs. And in this case, uh, it's not a glyph and it's not a fossil. And this is an actual dinosaur skull. And the white thing to the lower left there is a tennis shoe for scale. So it's over 20 inches tall if it's set up. And go ahead and go to the next picture. I've got a few pictures here so you can see it in different positions. And behind it is a stacked wall. So that's, there's actually in this cave, there's a small room and it's got stacked stone walls. And inside that was this skull. And it appears to be something like um, uh, like a Parasaurolophilus or other type of dock-billed dinosaur. Um, and it's got the, the head uh, features and eye features and the bill and the tooth features are all the same as other species. But the, the protrusion at the top is a little different than what we know of. But this is bone. This isn't a fossil. And so let's move on to the next picture. There's another picture of it. And you can see the stacked wall a little bit better there. And let's go to another. And so this is as they were trying to get it up out of the 600 foot down cave. And um, you can already see they've already pulled a tooth fragment out of the jaw there. And so in this picture. So, th so this is something that's pretty hard for people to believe. Like, well, if people were dinosaurs, how come we don't? Well, there you go. I mean, I don't know how old this one was. Um, they were still working on this stuff when the finder and everybody kind of vanished. And um, last I saw, he was hanging out with Mexican government officials wearing a gold, shiny gold jacket. And I haven't heard from him since. <laughs> so, uh. yeah, but this is, this is real deal. This is not fake stuff. So let's move on to the next one. So this is another site that we're going to wrap back around on a little bit. Here's this one here is within oh, 30 miles of where I'm sitting right now and this is same thing it's an ancient site it's very heavily monumented um, what we see here is a like what we call a beer can monument but it's a little more special um, we see uh, below it a pointed elongated rock that points up to the carved out circle on that rock and uh, and then above on top of that is a elevated stone for verification and let's go on to the next one we'll see how this works so on that same stone that the Triangle Rock's pointing out, on the back side, there's a hole cut through it. And when we look through that hole, it looks at a secret location. And I never went over there, but you can see in the, the light there, there's a white square rock for an attention getter where they want you to look. So this that would be maybe a tomb location or a burial location. So let's move on. So at the same spot now, um, there's a big stone rabbit and I know it's a little difficult to make out and it takes a creative eye But that's what it is and cut into that are two circles and At the nose of what would be the rabbit is basically a triangle and the foot's tucked in which means don't go anywhere You're sitting on the location. So let's move on Now this is the same rock outcrop from the other side and it's a turtle and the heads on the left with an eye and a mouth and it's all sitting there and cut in front of it would be with a cut of a leaf or fern leaf. So it's stopping eating. It's acquiring what it's looking for. And it's, fin, it's more of a sea turtle and its fins are all positioned backwards behind it. 
So you could almost say that it's up on the bank on land at the foliage laying eggs. And so this is a deposition site. So let's move on. So here's the same site, and you see a dog there in the center of the picture. And to its right, you see kind of a dome shape, craft looking kind of rock. And to the left there is the same rock I showed you before that had the hole through it that we sight through and had the triangle rock pointing at it. And now you can see the relationship of those two together. Now, what the dog's walking on is a big, flat, what appears to be manufactured stone pad. So let's go on to the next picture. So here we see those two rocks again. The dome rock is on the left this time, and the rock with the hole in it being pointed at is on the right. And both of them have pointers that point toward each other. And so this is kind of a gateway or entry point, and it's kind of a natural ramp onto this flat pad. So let's move on to the next one. So this is this site from above, and now you see the large flat pad, um, and it's very flat, very flat. And you can see in the upper right of center, there is the rock that looked kind of like a craft, except now it looks a lot like a craft. And it's sitting all by itself and with a small protrusion or hatch on top. And then you have the other rock next to it. And so this is a site we actually scanned and picked up metals that we could not identify to anything known. And we picked up the presence of positive and negative magnetic eddies in the same space and time, which is not possible. You can't have them both. Um, but they sure were there. And we also had our machines all burn up in our hands, all our batteries die, laptops burned up, um, everything else, because something was sucking power through everything so fast it was just frying the PC boards. And then we managed to shield and then get a magnetic reading on top of the hill associated with this. And if you'll move on to the next picture, I believe, picked up an algorithmic signal being emitted out the top of the hill. And the two, the two graphs are the real scans. And so in the top one, you see the Earth's magnetic field, which is surprisingly constant. And it has a hot and a cold side based on its flow direction. When we get on top of the hill, on top of a square cube sitting there, we once we get them there, if it doesn't, you had to keep it from draining the batteries or frying the machine, we took samples there and it, it's a beacon being emitted uh, at, to an algorithmic wavelength of one fifty thousandth of a second and then overall pulsing in the signal pattern you see there. So whatever's in the hill is absorbing every bit of available electrons and, and the Earth's EM field and then emitting that same field resonance straight up as a beam into space uh, pulsed as an algorithm. So that shows you what's at these locations. So this oh. is, th we're looking at technology. Uh, yeah. we're, we're talking that that field, if you bring a car or a laptop within 250 feet of the center of that, um, it's going to fry it just like that. And then we're being shown, you know, conical craft, um, in glyphs and in physical model and in direction and then when you scan the hill you end up with something operating like a theoretical zero point device manipulating time space emitting one hell of an energy signal and pattern and absorbing every bit of electrical energy around it so i mean it's kind of like if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck you know so that's probably what's inside this hill to this day would be potential pre-flood technology that was remarked and it's interesting if we go to the sumerian texts they talk about the anunnaki pre-flood and after flood coming back and trying to find their objects and technology and sites after the flood and remarking those sites so i think wow. that's i think that's what we're actually seeing let's move on there you go Okay, so this is another <clears throat> monolithic model. Uh, it's a monumentation set. <clears throat> the lines and the angles and the marks all have meaning. Uh, we can't, we're not going to get into all those. But at this site, let's move on to the next picture. Um, 
now we got there following coded lines and symbols, the same mathematics and templates and things that we identify. And we come to that real strange looking outcrop. And in that outcrop is this cut out hollow. Now, in the bottom of the hollow, there's a raised portion with a divot and a channel. And then I you see can, that. You're right. And you can see how the red in the sandstone, and you know what makes that red, right? No, what? Fire. All right. So when you, but it's got to be hot. And when you heat sandstone up above like the melting point of some of our uh, softer metals like, like gold, silver, uh, things like that, um, it turns red. So that's a direct indicator of heat. So that's been used. What this is is a miniature smelter. It's a small example of a smelter that you could smelt gold out of ore with. Now, it's interesting. Here we go, metals again and all that. Now, this site is right back where, not far from where the turquoise mines and things are. And where they were mined, where we also know Mina del Tierra, which is the oldest and largest silver mine. Uh, one of the largest in the world and the oldest in North America is also at the same location. And they mine gold there. And what were the Anunnaki said to, to have done? To have come here and made people mine gold? Right. Right. And so we have evidence of creatures that match what we would show as the Anunnaki, not the Nephilim that looked human, but the Anunnaki, which were not human, um, that were potentially the tall whites or the grays that were in contact with people that did what the Hopi said and took out a lot of the dinosaurs for them, probably so they could do what? Mine gold. Why else would they, if right. that's who that was? And so here we find a small model of a smelter, probably to either mine and smelt a little or to establish a teaching routine to show the natives what the heck to do. So let's move on to the next picture. There you go. And here you have a glyph panel. Now, there's actually, I didn't include it in this, but there's actually a Bigfoot up on the top left, too, screaming. But what you see here is a Native American shaman to the left, and he has what a known thing. It's called a standard. It's a pole with feathers all the way up it. So he has a feathered standard. He has a feathered headdress on, and he's carrying a shield. Now, it's interesting is there's another character to the right that he's greeting or meeting, and that is portrayed like a gray. Three fingers and toes, the same gray head and a lightning bolt over its head. And let's move to the next picture and we'll get right in front of that one. There you go. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Go back. So we should have, I don't know if they're out of order or not, but we should no, have. There's not, a, there's not a three here. Okay, there's let's just. two to four. Okay, let's go ahead and go back then. And three must have got lost somewhere, if we can. Back to the one I just showed? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, no, the, the, the previous one. The previous one? image, yes, yes. And so if we look at this depiction, though, it's interesting, and we all noticed it, is the leg of what would be the gray-type entity is purposefully drawn so it looks like it's coming out or emerging. It didn't have to try to get it all the pigment all the way back up in that little thing where the rock edge is, but they did it. And it gives the illusion that it's emerging from a crack or emerging from the ground. And that's something that was really, to us, striking. Um, because where are we? We're in a location basically smack dab between Baca location number one, Baca location number two, which is the Dulce base, which is said to be underground, inhabited by underground reptoids. And then we have glyphs of the same thing and just the repeated whole trip. And then you have uh, an obvious small, a small example of an active gold smelter with applied heat. And then you have beings that match the whole nine yards in the same place that are said to make people mine gold and blah, blah, blah. And so you just run all this together, all of it coming back, you know, 9,000, 10,000 years old. So let's go ahead and move up to the next one. There you go. And so this is also one of the early artifacts and <clears throat> people could say, oh yeah, it was, you know, the natives made it, whatever. Whoever made this had a knowledge of minerals that would phosphoresce. So the lit up thing isn't Photoshop. That's when you shine a black light on the piece. So the rock inlay they did there is a phosphorescent mineral. So when you put it under UV light, it glows. Now, these pendants are 9,700 years old. The only way you're going to know that is if you have a UV light source. And the only way you're going to appreciate this pendant 
is if you have a UV light source. So that speaks for itself in that term. And then let's move on. All right. Here you are. And then here's just another example of an early coin. And I don't remember the full history on these, but there's been a couple found that show either one of those beings or what potentially could be a hybrid between one of those beings and a human. And let's move on. Come here, honey. And so this is the location where all this stuff goes. And we actually gained access to the lease on this property and were able to go in and mine in the ancient mines that were up until this point closed and largely unknown. And we were allowed, we were able to mine the same turquoise that is being showed in the Alisco artifacts. Is any of that turquoise uh, uh, phosphorescent? Um, you know, <clears throat> no, it's not. And But what we do have here is polypseudomorphic. So where we've actually had a, an atomic um, change of identity, so to speak, from one mineral to another, where things turned into turquoise. And I do have a, a polypseudomorphic and crystalline turquoise geode, which is the only place in the world that anything like that's ever been located. And I think, go on one more picture, and I think we've got even another picture probably of... Uh, a mineral specimen from there. Yeah, so what you'll see is this this turquoise is deposited um, and grown. It actually grows as a crystal form, and that's the rarest form. So, And this is the Chachawedal turquoise mine. So it is the actual same mines that the turquoise that was being used by the Aztec and Maya and everybody in their ritual masks and everything. That's the same stuff. But this is up here in New Mexico near oh. where the aliens are being depicted with the dinosaurs and the same thing. It's just, and then you have, of course, the artifacts from 9,700 years ago that are holding turquoise um, and most likely uh, from these same mines. So I think we might be getting near the end here. Let's go on. There's one more. One more. And so there here's just another collection of the variety of, so all this is actual turquoise, and there's some uh, matrix rock on the bottom, a couple. But this is the variations of turquoise we have. And, of course, basically all this is coming from strata that right next to it is a gold mine, right next to that is silver mines, and then this represents a source of, uh, of aluminum, anhydrous aluminum. So, But I think that's it. I think so. And for some reason, I'm not getting you on my secondary screen here. Probably. I still see me on me anyway. Yeah. So I'll just put you here. There we go. Here we are. That's just me now. What a fascinating journey. It's well, absolutely amazing. And you know, and it's it's funny because even though how long did that just take us to develop a context and then lead them through, um, and this is such a tiny drop in a very very big bucket. Um, it's 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 hard to quantify that in, in a way that I can express to people how much there really is. I mean, I'm able to show like one example of each thing. So to, d to develop the type of confidence that, oh, wow, that's even a stone monument or whatever. I mean, it's very difficult in this type or any type of venue because there's no way to convey so much information in, in any short period of time, you know, within hours or even days. So getting the full effect like what rings around in my brain and my understanding is a lot different than I can even deliver here, Jerry. I mean, um, hopefully it's been a, 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 a decent example of how these things are interconnected and how they support the native lore and histories. And then they support the enigmatic evidences being found all over the world that are dictating this other truth. And then, they can even be described in the Sumerian cuneiform. Um, and we're hearing the same basic descriptions, you know. And then when we're seeing these early inhabitants from uh, what apparently is the Black Sea and Samaria and, and uh, you know, Spain, France up in there, Egypt, uh, Libya, uh, the entire region, 
there. And, um, and then we see these influences, how they're taking information back to where they are of mystical places with dragons and with monsters and things. Um, it's interesting to me because I don't, I can't help but wonder if the early explorers of North America, the early occupants of North America, those that were coming back and forth, uh, their satellite colonies weren't experiencing these monsters and dragons here in North America um, that we see depicted along with the people on our glyph sites. And you know, these aren't the only ones. I mean, you know, these are the ones we have discovered and we have photographed. I didn't show any of the hundreds of even much better ones that have been found from the Grand Canyon to, you know, I mean, all over. I mean, you know, the depictions are endless. And, uh, but it should help close a gap, you know. And when we talk about Sumerians, Babylonians, you know, Titicaca, you know, where does that word mean? Oh, it means jaguar or whatever. No, it doesn't. It means Titicaca. It means Titty is 10, Kaka is mine, 10 mine at Lake Titicaca, the world's oldest 10 mines. And we're talking, this is in Babylonian that Titicaca means tin mines, and then you find Babylonian uh, idols on the handles of ceremonial daggers and things taken from the island in Lake Titicaca. I mean, where do you have to not tie this together? You know, where is this not self-evident? And then when we can show these 9,700-year-old to 11,400-year-old actual artifacts, depicting beings that were potentially described to us in the Sumerian text and, and were known through Assyria and Babylon and, and all these places and even into Egypt about these beings and it's the same guys and then it's the same guys doing the same things that the Hopi talk about. You know, you're talking intercontinental, global vision, global view, global activity that gels. It actually works. You know, where did the tin come from for the Bronze Age? Yep. Where did the copper come from? North America. That's like DeSoto mines we talked about where you could fly a plane inside. These are, man, there's enough copper came out of DeSoto to fuel the Bronze Age, um, let alone all the rest of the copper. America and the Great Lakes was being mined uh, by Alexander. You know, they found in, published in Scientific American, that wasn't fake gold coins, you know, thousands of hoaxed gold. Nobody's going to spend that much in gold to try to hoax something and then not even get it. Um, you know, putting elephants and all these things on the coins and then uh, uh, signatures or whatever of Alexander up there in the Great Lakes mining what? Copper. You know, the tin. Yeah. So basically the copper came from North America. The tin came from South America. They hauled it all over there and they built the Bronze Age. They've never found sources for copper and tin of the gravity that would have fueled what they know was absorbed in the Bronze Age, it wouldn't have happened. They never found them. Just like they never found sources for gold in South America that could have ever actually excused the amount of gold. Um, you know, Spain lost 200 ships on one reef outside of Cuba, and they're all laden in gold. Um, it's 200 ships on one reef. How many total did they haul? I mean, so if we actually look... Um, there was early writs about Spain estimating up to 600 million tons of gold had been put away and stashed and less than 1% ever made it back to the old world, which the first boat load made them the richest entities on earth. Even 10% of the first boat made the king of Spain the second richest entity, but just 10% <clears throat> of one boat. And 200 boats went down on one reef. I mean, how many made it, you know? So it does, there's an amount there that you begin to go, wait a second. For one, where the heck did all that go? Um, and then two, they estimated that 2% of the gold ever hit a boat. Spain estimated 2% ever hit. Everything else was mined and cashed and mined and cashed faster than they could try to haul it on ships. So they, I mean, an actual estimate that's conservative is 600 million tons. Now, why were they doing it? Do why? It had to be for something else. And that's what we're finding is everybody knew this truth. 
the Jesuit priests knew this truth, the Templars knew this truth, everybody. And we talk about the secret writings of the Essenes and the latest in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Watchers and all these other things. And we go back all the way to the Sumerian cuneiform and we look and go, wait a second. Hold on a minute. Who are these guys? They've been telling us about these guys the whole time and here they are. Here, yeah. here it is, you know, so. Absolutely mind-boggling, Robert. Just mind-boggling. So, are you are you going out again, uh, looking at some of these places more closely in the in the coming months, uh, anytime soon? Yeah, I'm gonna sure are trying to. We're trying to organize and arrange. Um, they're just plain and simple. Some of these places are completely off limits, and um, you know you basically have to conduct guerrilla archaeology in order to get the information and the data. Um, but it's important, you know, this stuff supersedes all human beings. It'll, a lot of it was here long, long, long before we were, and it'll be here long, long, long after we're gone. There's no ownership to things that supersede the existence of species, so to speak. Um, well, I think we're probably interested to join you on something. Our, our foray into, uh, doing naughty things like that it involves us being chased by death squads and, yeah. You know things like that in the Amazon is. I, I'm sure maybe the penalties are much more. You know. Well, it's site to site, comfortable. Lo yeah, location to location. Some things we can go on, some things we can't. Some of it's just because maybe a, uh, a, 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 I wouldn't say ignorant, but a less informed landowner that's paranoid, or uh, some things would be you know by the government itself or by entities that don't want action. So who knows? It's just. Well, I'm sure we're going to find something in the future that you and I are both going to work on. You know, you and Kathy are always, always invited um, on anything I've got going, you know, if you're. Yeah, I, I regret we didn't make it over to Skinwalker Ranch. We really didn't cover that. Um, no. You, you you were over there and the lightning struck your trailer and blew it all to hell. Yeah, yeah. The following weekend, actually, is when the trailer got blown to bits. But basically, it missed us by a week. Um, it was yeah. interesting. Yeah, we were in it on Saturday, and then the following Saturday it was erased with prejudice. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't much left. I saw the pictures. I when I when I read that, um, it I, I was just like, I didn't even know what to think. Yeah, and being as you know, we mapped ionizing radiation higher than Chernobyl, uh, coming out of the hill we stayed on. So, you know. Oh, well, that's, that's risky business, isn't it? Yeah, and we'll have to get into that, too, because, you know, that was another algorithmic trip, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that would be something we could spend another few hours on because that's immensely interesting. Right, right. Well, when I started this show, I told folks I wish they could have been a fly on the wall to have just heard you and I talk. Mm -hmm. And I think we have pretty closely done that because right now we are at four hours and a half for the show, which is one of the longest shows I've ever done. And honestly, I know you and I could just talk for another two or three hours easily. Or days. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and I'm sure we will. And that's why I say, that how do you, how do you even, you know, I've got 30, 35 years of this. You've got, you know, so much time. How does, you know, everything I'm showing or most everything I've shown has never been seen on large public platforms, you know? So, and that's a, that's a, those are drops in the bucket. So if you take it all as a whole, it just demonstrates a direct story. Here you go, boom. But how, oh, do, yeah. how do you bring that out when no one show, no five shows, um, you know, I mean, and then you have to have it on a platform for multitudes. I mean, just the sands of the sea type exposure to be able to get it out to enough people to where it forms – uh, an answer so that can be then factored into everyone's equation you know so so that's the whole point of this thing is to begin to do the dump let's say but i mean i'm sitting on two terabytes here i showed what 70 photographs yeah yeah i have two hundred fifty thousand. i mean yeah so what do you what do you do just, right just a thumbnail sketch really and yeah. as, as dense as the information was and that being a thumbnail sketch, I think it pretty well illustrates that, you know, what, what you've got is such a wealth of knowledge to explain the past in a way that's really quite relevant and is also unheard of in our, our 
current, you know, world view of things. Well, you know, I'll be honest with you. Since I look at the beach from a mile offshore, I do not know as much detail as so many people that I want to work with. But what I do know is the connective, I do have the connective tissue <clears throat> and this other picture that mm -hmm. they all need. I mean, there needs to be a hub for all this to bring it all into a loop. So do I know that much about the sites in South America? No. Nope. Do I know that much about each individual culture? Nope. Or any other rest, really. There's everyone that I admire, you included, Graham Hancock and others, um, have really done their homework and, and have such a huge perspective, right, of diverse information to lot together. But at the same time, yeah. There's not that there's not as much connective tissue to spell out like definitives. So there's always so many questions to so many questions. And then what what I want to do, though, is bring those people who have not just that intellect and that experience, but also the avenues and the vehicles to get the information out, get them down to the same table and, sure. and say, check this out. Here's the hub and here's some keys and here's how these things can be interconnected and fashioned together. And here's some real stuff we can actually potentially go crack that, you know, it's like whatever's emitting the, the energy out of the hill that, you know, yeah, these things need to be brought to light, you know, at some point or another. So, but it's going to take a hell of a, have to take a hell of a team to, to do that. There's no way I could do it. No, not just, and not we just felt me. the same way with, with what we've uncovered in South America. The, uh, you know, the willingness of working with people who are interested in actually bringing out the knowledge and don't have their own personal agenda is an important aspect of this because otherwise it becomes tainted. Right. And that's one of the reasons why we've kind of held back on some of the information and yeah, not really that much, but enough to where, you know, I mean, Let's face it. I mean, some of the things you and I have talked about tonight, um, there are a lot of folks who would listen to this and they'd be very open to it. But there are others that would just be, you know, we're targets for them to yeah. shoot arrows towards. Yeah. And that's that's what I when I kind of mentioned, that, hey, you have to do your own research. I mean, I invite anybody to go and start to dig based on what's been expressed, um, especially mm -hmm. since none. You know, when people find all these finds, they go, oh, he discovered this and that and this and that. We didn't just run across these locations. If the information wasn't valid, we wouldn't have found them. Um, that's true. And that's the thing is each one tests and validates the previous information. And then when you can dig something up 100 feet deep, we're talking 100 feet. Modern archaeology, if, not, if something isn't at 10 centimeters, they quit. Class 3 archaeological surveys, 10 centimeters. So, I mean, we dig 100 feet before we find signs of the activity a lot of times, right? I mean, the last big hole we dug had a 1,000 foot of entry ramp into it. Um, nobody's doing that. I mean, so everybody can throw out an opinion, but until if you want to just go by statistical uh, averages and log it together, you're going to look at it's more probable that the blue skies, because there's an ocean above you than it is. I mean, because what we demonstrate has statistical odds beyond that of most of the things we understand um, sure. into the into the trillions to one, you know, and that is beyond a lot of the things that we take for granted that we know are true every day. And so being able to do that with a skeptic, you just can't do it all in a show. But what can be done is, hey, go from here. It's like I said, put two, two trees next to each other. And only have one leaf touching one leaf at the top and have one root tip touching one root tip at the bottom. And that's the circle we've made compared to all the roots and all the leaves of where this could go. And all it takes is now is people to take a look. And I challenge anybody to, um, you know, go map, have a statistician just map out real quick how those plates in Mexico that are whatever going to match a glyph site we found that nobody else has ever shown you a picture of that glyph. Um, and they're identical. I mean, line for line, point for point, character for character, even right down to the age, you know, being well, we, even so. have, we even have seen these in, in uh, Peru and Bolivia. So, I mean, it, it, you're right. It's a commonality. There's a, 
at least in that aspect that we're familiar with yeah for south america we know there's a connection between those two places and i know there are connections beyond that as well because let's face it the world population was traveling the world you know before whatever this great flood thing was yeah. and then after that they were doing it as well we we've seen proof yeah. of this they started doing it again in at least uh, two to three phases um and it seems like something slacks them back who knows what it is or what occurs or what happens but they've definitely you know gone up and gone back down and gone up and gone back down so well, i um, think we might even have some clues as to what that might be I'm not ready to go into that yet right. but you know the um the other thing about the dinosaurs, uh, reflecting back on that for a moment, in Peru, we have seen on their pottery these guys riding on the back of an allosaur. Right. You know, people with dinosaurs riding with dinosaurs. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's, there's some, um, some very intriguing possibilities because of this covid thing we're not really able to travel back to peru and do the investigations that we really love doing you know working with you and going out and uh, doing some more investigation here in the united states and also with john and myra nichols i mean they've got some just fantastic information and i should introduce the two of you because i think you both have clues to each other right uh so you know, there, there's information here, and it's a it's a hell of a big story that has not been told. It should be, so we'd understand really more about the past than what we're being provided with. You know, elemental history lessons and the contrived nature of the manipulation of history. Right. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, we're going to get back out to New Mexico and uh, hook up with you and go do some things. That's a certainty. Well, good. I'll be ready when you are. And I'm going to be plugging along until, until these things happen. So we're making efforts right now to plan a couple of uh, entries into a couple of locations. And uh, like I said, we're trying to, to build up enough and get the resources put together enough to where we can make them happen. And um, they're just sitting right around the corner. So, you know. Yeah, well, you're there. right there at Ground Central with a lot of this stuff. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Okay. Well, I guess that pretty much sums up the evening, uh, folks, for you who are still tuned in and, and uh, <laughs> well, they haven't, you know, gone they're loyal. Long. Yeah, they're loyal to be hanging around four and a half. I give it to them that. Thank you, guys. Well, we, we've got some really fantastic people in uh, our community that are vastly interested in this. And uh, gosh, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you about that another time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure they'll be interested in a lot of this beyond, you know, what they've seen this evening. So we'll we'll talk about that between ourselves. But I, I just want to thank you for taking this amount of time out of your life to be here with us and provide this this kind of uh, information that you really can't hear anywhere else. Well, I want to say thank you guys for giving me an outlet. And um, which allows me to do what I dreamed of doing, which is basically just telling the truth. I wanted to find it for the sole reason of giving it to everybody else because I got so, so pissed at a young age we were being lied to. So <laughs> that's and uh, that was our motivation for Expeditions TV. Yeah, there you we go. The same thing. There you go. So I want to plug myself real quick. If anybody wants to Please see do. a little more, um, you can go to CriterExploration.com on the web. Uh, there's very, it's very limited what's been put in. We have a lot of the categories and a lot of the, everything set up for information to go in. But um, actually, we've maxed out our data on the site early. So we're going to have to bump that up as we get more resources. And um, you can also find us on YouTube at KX Space Crider Space Exploration. Um, or you can uh, find us on Facebook at, on our cryptid, on our cryptid stuff at KX Space Cryptid Dash hominin space research space group dash nm dash bigfoot or we also have a standard facebook page and group called crater exploration so if you'll um send those to me mm -hmm. uh text or messenger either way 
I'll make sure that on the page that I've created that I have all the links to you mm -hmm. so they can find you just by clicking and not remembering any of this or writing it down. Okay. Yep. You bet. All right. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, you got to well, say you howdy to Kathy for me. And uh, yeah, she's sitting over here monitoring loyally and uh, just as vastly interested as I am, as you know, I know Tara May is just interested as hell as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, matter of fact, she wanted me to say hi to you during the break. She said, make sure you say hi for me. That was so nice of them to mention me. So, so thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, she's a real sweetheart and we look forward to seeing her again soon too. Yeah. She's good in the field. She's a good partner. Um, I wish, uh, unfortunately, there's some places I probably just will not take her for fear uh, of potential danger, but um, I'll tell you what, she's good to have in the field. I really enjoy doing this work with her. So, I'll tell you what, when we went down to Peru and uh, ended up in north central Peru, ending up with, you know, death squad coming for us and special forces rescuing us, ahead of all of that, I had severe reservations about having, you know, of course myself there, but, you know, Kathy as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow, you know, I couldn't have done it without her, you know, in hindsight, it just wouldn't have been the same. Yeah. Uh, I think our women are extraordinarily resourceful and absolutely brilliant um, statisticians and analyzers. I know Kathy, she sees patterns and things and I don't see them at all. And so, you know, I've got a great deal of respect for her. I'm sure Tara May is the same way. Oh, she is. And um, that's one thing I say about her being good in the field. She's a, a natural for it. And um, she might have been spoiled a little bit running around with me and not, not know how rare that actually is or her ability, either one, because she's already better at a lot of the stuff than a lot of the pros that I've known been doing it years. Um, but, you know, and, and more so when we do like the Bigfoot stuff, there's, I, you know, I wouldn't even take her near a 15 foot male. I mean, a, a 15 foot, I wouldn't take her anywhere near a 12 foot male. Um, and, you know, we've been aggressively yelled at and uh, with her there. And it made me more nervous that she was there than, than being aggressively yelled at, you know, so. Yeah. You know, there's some of those things I can't control. They get too far out there, but yeah, well, such is the nature of being an adventurer and an explorer, I suppose. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And I always have that fear of accountability. I've always done that with my crews and my teams as well. Whatever happens to them is largely, I feel accountable for. So, um, same here. Yeah. Guys that are really aware of what the potentials are. I don't, I don't, then you're on your own buddy. You know, we're all here together, but but it, you know you're accountable for your own stuff but uh but yeah anybody else I, every time I'm, I'm like you know protective guard guard dog over everybody so but good deal all right it's been excellent man i love it thank you for your time have a great evening buddy we'll be in touch soon send me those links please i will do i'll get right right on that and uh yeah as well thanks everybody for holding on this long it's been great um, good to see you and uh look forward to more have a great evening, man. Okay. All right, folks, that wraps up the show. Uh, I know it's been a long one, and uh, my feelings are it's been one hell of a great show. Uh, it's probably one that is right up there in the top three as far as being epic. So I want to thank everyone for being here this evening. Uh, thanks for watching, for hanging out, being a part of this. And especially for all of our uh, uh, our Patreon community, without you, this show would not have been possible. There's no way in hell it would have been. And there really wouldn't have been any reason to do it either. Uh, because of you, there was a reason. And this is why we're here. We'll have another show put together as soon as possible. Get it out to you. Thank you for watching. It's time for me to fade away. So I will see you next time. And for those of you who follow us on Facebook, I will do a follow-up on Facebook probably tomorrow night just to talk a little bit about how amazing this show was for all those poor souls who missed it and just didn't have a chance to sit here and chew their fingernails and listen to this amazing information. So for that, uh, being the last comment of the night, thank you so much, Robert. I know you're still there. Hang on, buddy. I'll say goodbye to you properly. For the rest of you, have a great evening, everyone. I will see you next time. I'm going to fade away. Good night, folks.